Okay, I'll sit there. Sorry, I was uh, messing around with my, my microphone for a second. Uh, but tonight on Bread Theory, we are going to be talking about how the concept of race, specifically whiteness, was first created. What its origins were, um, why it became used the way that it's been used, uh, and, you know, just all about it. Uh, we're going to be looking at a specific podcast episode, which I will link presently in the chat. Let me just find that one again. Uh, it's from the podcast series Seen on Radio, a really great one. They, they take some really deep dives into a lot of issues that <clears throat> affect the political discourse uh, pretty much all the time. Uh, so this is this is the episode. It's called How Race Was Made. Good evening, Natalie. Good to see you. How are you doing tonight? So this is the, the second episode in their series. They have a whole long series called Seeing White, and it goes through a bunch of different issues with um, race, basically, and focused in North America mostly, but uh, it, it covers a range of topics, everything up through policing in, in the modern day and, and a lot of issues that are still ongoing. So we're just going to cover the, the second episode in the series um, and uh, kind of go from there. So as always, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to, to ask. You need caffeine. Oh, I feel that. Yeah, kind of a lazy Sunday for me too. Didn't, didn't do a whole lot but wash clothes and go grocery shopping. Um, all right, one second. I'm going to link up the episode. There we go. So we'll probably do something like that because it is a podcast, so it's mostly just going to be, you know, uh, the audio portion of it. Good to see you tonight as well, John. How are you doing? Yeah, I guess without further ado, unless anyone has any questions, we'll uh, we'll get to it. So again, the podcast is seen on radio, and uh, the series is How Race Was Made. This is episode two of, of Seeing White. That's the, the series overall. And we're going to get into the history of how race was made. Here we go. Whether you're struggling with grief, relationships, or stress, or having trouble sleeping, or meeting goals... Online therapy might yeah. come we'll skip, slash C. We'll skip the ads. And maybe, you know, of course your book starts thousands of years ago, yeah. but here's a thought I had about the starting Good to point, hear which is um, when I was in high school in Minnesota in the late 1970s, mm -hmm. I, re oh, I can yeah. still remember Fellow very Minnesota. vividly in my social studies textbook, the three races oh, of yeah. man. Yeah, yeah. And I can see the images yeah. of the Mongoloid, the Caucasoid, and the Negroid. Uh -huh. um, it was presented as a scientific biological That's right. fact. That's right. That's right. Isn't, isn't that ridiculous? Uh, the three races of men, as, as though this is some, there's somehow something biological about uh, race beyond how much melanin you produce. And there's there's a really good graphic. I'll see if I can find it at some point here, but shows the the distribution of uh, the various races of people, and it's pretty clear. The further you get up towards the poles, or, or lower depending on the way you're looking at it, for the further you get towards the poles, the less melanin is contained in the the native peoples from there. And the entire reason is it's a balance between. Uh, trying to avoid skin cancer, which darker skin helps avoid skin cancer, uh, and being able to absorb enough vitamin D through the sun's rays. That's that's the principal way that you get vitamin D is is in through your skin, um, <clears throat> and that is harder to do if you have more melanin in your skin. So in the the cloudier you know places with longer winters, less direct sunlight, where the with you know the rays of the sun are are never hitting directly on you people tend to have lighter skin. And the opposite is true when you're getting to the more direct latitudes where the sun is, is hitting you more directly. And that's it. That's the entire reason why people have 
why there's a, a, a you know, distribution in skin tone and color. Uh, that's it. Thank you for the follow, uh, Maz Mizumi2. Uh, we were talking about how whiteness was made. Um, anyway, so when you look at things that way, it gets pretty ridiculous that any sort of a scientific analysis beyond that would really be made. Because other than that, there really is no difference between people. I mean, obviously, we're, we're able to interbreed. So it's not significant enough of a, a genetic difference that that prevents it. Um, so there's really no other difference beyond that. But I digress. It's, it's just in, wild to hear the way the textbooks used to uh, divide things up. Good to see you, Ali Osher. Let me give you a shout out there. Everyone go follow Ali Osher. A really great streamer. Covers Congress and the President a lot. There you go. Did that not work? No, I don't I think maybe I didn't do that right. Let's try that shout out once again. Ali Osher. There we go. So you can go follow Ali Osher, really great streamer. Um, yeah, let's continue on in the in the podcast here. Sort of like the you know, yeah. there's certain kinds yeah. of rocks, and yeah. here's the map yeah. of the Quite world, yeah. and then these yeah. are the three races. Yeah. So, um, is it a scientific biological fact? <laughs> <laughs> The three races um, in the order usually presented, Caucasoid, Mongoloid, and Negroid, Caucasoid at the top, uh, is not a biological that's, fact no, and only became science in the sense of anthropologists said that th this is true in the 1940s. That's Nell Irvin Painter, historian, Princeton professor emerita, and author of The History of White People. I'm John Bewin, it's Seen on Radio, Welcome to part two of our series, Seeing White. And this whole series Looking at the past and the present of whiteness in the world and especially... I'll say, even if you think you know a lot about race relations and the history of racism in, in the U.S., there's going to be a lot of stuff that you're going to find eye-opening in this series. Um, I know that was definitely the case for me. So, so yeah, I can't recommend it enough. Uh, seen on radio's series, um, How Race... Um, Seeing White, excuse me especially in the United States, where this idea of being white came from and what it's for. In this episode, we're going back. Well, not really to the beginning. Science now tells us that in the beginning of the human story, people evolved in Africa from one common ancestor a couple hundred thousand years ago. We're all kin and all African if you just go back far enough. Over time, some people walked out of Africa and spread across the world. The branches of the family that spent thousands of years in colder places without a lot of sun, they lost much of their melanin and turned a bunch of different shades depending on the conditions where they were. That's how we became a species ranging from the darkest brown to the lightest pink beige and everything in between. Shades of brown with an array of yellowish and reddish tinges. <clears throat> All of that explains why people look different. It does not explain the wildly inconsistent and ever-changing groupings that people have concocted over the last few centuries. It doesn't explain my high school textbook. So we believe we need to know how we got this thing called race, if we're gonna understand racism. Suzanne Plissick is with the Racial Equity Institute. The team is based in Greensboro, North Carolina, but travels the country doing anti-racism workshops. I recorded Suzanne and her colleagues a few months ago in Charlotte. REI's courses are not diversity training. Their approach is not kumbaya, let's get along, let's tolerate one another. Instead, they drop a whole lot of knowledge, especially history, but also sociology, biology. We know, for example, since the Human Genome Project, that we are what percentage genetically the same as human beings? 99 point what? Nine. 99.9. 9. 
genetically the same. There is more genetic variation in a flock of penguins than there is in the human race. There is more genetic variation within groups that have come to be called races than there is across groups that have come to be called races. Statistically likelier that I am closer to you genetically. Suzanne, who is white, points at a black man. Than I am to you. And then a white woman. Anthropologists finally say. That's really another way of saying there, there is no difference beyond very superficial things. And there's other things that, that <clears throat> sometimes track along racial lines, like uh, blood type. Type O is, is more common among like Native Americans. Um, but these are not really material differences. There's nothing really that's, that's different across racial lines that matters in any real way. Um, continuing on. And it is way past due that race is anthropological nonsense. <laughs> Is that the same? I think she's probably about to, to say something similar, but that doesn't mean that race doesn't affect anything. So the, the, the trope that um, now for some reason conservatives have locked on to is that we should all just be colorblind and for, you know, forget about our racial, you know, if it's just a construct, if it doesn't actually make any difference, let's just all be colorblind and then the world will get better. They always trundle out that, that which I believe is even a misquote of uh, Morgan Freeman saying that, oh, just stop talking about race and then it'll get better. Um, but just because something is a social construct doesn't mean that it doesn't affect things. Gender is a social construct and uh, it affects a lot of stuff. It, money is a social construct, but I don't think anyone would argue that it doesn't affect anything just because it's something that people made up and agree upon. So, so race is the same way. <laughs> even though it is mostly just made up uh, arbitrary differences that don't have a lot of intrinsic meaning to them, it still affects people in their daily lives. So to then go back and say, let's be colorblind about things is to basically stick your head in the sand and say, I'm going to be blind to your plight and the way that, that someone different than me or someone who looks different than me is, is treated and it's basically just a dismissive way to say, stop complaining, you know, we're all the same, you know, and that's obviously not the case because you look at any sort of outcome in society, if it were the case that we all didn't care about race, you wouldn't see any differences between the races in terms of um, socioeconomic spread. You'd have it just as proportional amount of, of you know, black CEOs as white CEOs of major corporations. You still would get hierarchies based on economics because that's what capitalism is. It's all about imposing hierarchies based on uh, economic differences. But you wouldn't see it based on racial differences. And of course, we do see that everywhere. Um, there's huge disparities in sentencing. Uh, you know, if a, a white defendant and a black defendant have the same priors, the same rap sheet, and commit the same crime. Doesn't even matter the, the makeup, the racial makeup of the jury. That black person is much more likely to get a, a longer sentence. And I don't even know what the discrepancy is, but it's, it's, it, it's statistically significant. It's, it's noticeable. Black people get longer sentences just for being black because people are more likely to just assume that they are guilty, even if they don't recognize that in themselves, even if they believe themselves to not be prejudiced, that just tends to be the way that uh, it shakes out. So, yes, social construct, but also important to, to recognize and to try and overcome and work through. And that doesn't happen just by ignoring things. Same thing as saying it's not real? No. No, because it's real. It is powerfully real. It's politically sure. and socially real. So we need to know how did we get it? And what we say is we constructed it. To tell the story of the construction of race and therefore of whiteness, let's go back to the beginnings of Western civilization. 
Why? Well, because of course it's Westerners who would come to call themselves white, but also because Westerners would become the inventors, eventually, of race as we know it. We go back to Greece because that's where we think of as our, as our cultural beginnings. And in ancient Greece, says Nell Painter, that's good. That's a good point, Ali Osher. Ali says, I am mixed race and disabled, but humans have a long way to go to be colorblind. As the 1970s and 80s and 2020 with the BLM movement, uh, he says that my mom is Cuban, presents as white passing. Uh, that's, a, that's a key thing, too. But has a black Indian mother. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you get at something really important there, because when it comes to race relations, more than anything, it's not about what you necessarily even identify as or the culture that you grew up in or any of that sort of thing. It's what, what do strangers assume you are when they see you on the street? That, more than anything, flavors how they are going to treat you. Um, so there could be, you know, you know, if, if you are more likely to be white passing, like you have lighter skin for whatever race or ethnicity you identify with, you're not going to be as likely to be hassled by the police or hassled by a prospective employer. Uh, people are going to be more likely to give you the benefit of the doubt in, in any given situation. So yes, we have a long ways to go to be so-called colorblind, but we, we don't, we, we you can't just skip to the end. Of course, all of us want a society where race no longer plays a factor in the outcome of your life or the likelihood of a certain outcome in your life. But you can't just jump to the end and, and pretend that we're already there and have that just magically appear. It takes a lot of work and a lot of unlearning and a lot of uh, self-work as well just to identify your own prejudices. And we all have them. I'm not going to sit here and claim that I don't have prejudices against any particular group. I'm, I'm sure that I do that have just been ingrained into me through growing up in this society. Uh, you know, definitely the way that, that different groups are portrayed on, on TV is going to affect people's general view of one group or another. Um, it reminds me of, of a, a black Proud Boy that got interviewed. And he was talking about his experiences being in the Proud Boys. And he was one who didn't really believe that, that race racism was real anymore. He thought it had gone... By the wayside, he just wanted to do the same sort of things the other Proud Boys wanted. You know, uh, put up Western chauvinism, whatever that is supposed to mean, and all that sort of thing. But he found that wherever he went, people would make these, well, they would say things that showed their underlying assumptions about him. Be like, it's so great that you made it, that you have a really good job. Because he had a good job. He uh, was was financially well off. Um, didn't have a lot of the struggles that, that other people of his race have and they would say oh that's so great that you made it up out of the ghetto and oh isn't, isn't it awesome that you did that without having a dad and he's like well wait a minute i do have a dad my dad's in my life what are you talking about and he found <laughs> through interactions with, with other proud boys that yeah they have all sorts of assumptions about him even though they were trying to be nice to him as well and that's one of the reasons that that even so-called positive stereotypes can be pretty insidious because it still prejudges the way that you are. You know, it, 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 it assumes a lot of stuff about you, even if it is, quote unquote, a good thing, um, like, like what a lot of Asian people experience being uh, looked at as the model minority. Uh, it affects the way people treat you and... In general, that's that's not going to be a good thing because they don't see you for a person. They, they're seeing a bunch of assumptions about you, whether or not they're true. And that's going to affect, say, in their career, where they, where they might be guided. If you are an Asian person, perhaps as you're coming through school, you might be uh, given guidance through professors to pursue things in mathematics or or um, other technical skills, engineering, things to do with numbers, because it's assumed that, that all Asians are, are good with numbers. Uh, and that's not necessarily the case. People are, are more or less the same. There's just a, an even def distribution of the various skills and, and passions and, and, and what have you 
across all races and all socioeconomic backgrounds. So it doesn't really do any good to push people in a certain direction based on what part you think they fit in. It's, it, you know, let's look at the reverse of that model minority and then being, you know, assumed to be good at numbers. What if your passion is, say, uh, the cello? I believe that that's Yo-Yo Ma's um, instrument, right? I, w I wouldn't be surprised if he's gotten lots of, of strange looks when he talks to people who don't know who he is and he talks about being in music. I'm sure other artists who are of any sort of Southeast Asian descent struggle with that same thing because it's assumed that, you know, why would you be in the arts? Why would you be in English or, or music or whatever? Because you're supposed to be good at math and science and engineering and that sort of thing. That's where you belong. So again, that, that's putting up a, a stumbling block for a lot of, of people of, of that background that has no place, that, that doesn't benefit anybody. Um, so that's important to think about when we're thinking about different stereotypes and how some are positive stereotypes and others are negative. There's, there's always a flip side to every stereotype. Always flip the flip side. <laughs> uh, so Ali says Cubans are assumed to be Castro supporters from 1957 to 2000. Cubans existed before and after. Sure. Yeah. Just because you come from Cuba. In fact, more likely than not, given the, the population that got out of Cuba, people that live in, that come from Cuba, that were, were um, refugees or exiles for one reason or another, are more likely going to be very pro-capitalist because they didn't want to be in Cuba. They are coming from a lot of the former land owning and, and wealthy groups of, of, of people that uh, were kind of uh, that had their land taken from them during land reform, um, that had their businesses taken over from the beginning of the revolution. So it's not necessarily, I mean, it's, it's more likely that they're going to be against um, any sort of communist government. So that's true. Ali also says ghetto was originally a Jewish construct. Absolutely. Yeah, ghetto just is a, is a concentration of one ethnicity more or less by force into an area. Um, it's just that since integration, that has been one way that, that white wealthy elites have controlled uh, the rise of other black people is by basically forcing them into certain parts of a, a city that were less desirable and or forcing them into a school district that they could then pull all the funding from. Um, lots of ways around that. There are Twitch stereotypes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there probably are Twitch stereotypes too, but that, that's a little bit different than racial stereotypes. That's, that's more um, affinity group, I guess, stereotypes. Or, or maybe you might even say culture. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. If, is there really a Twitch culture? Um, yeah, that, that's a totally different thing. That, that goes beyond that because it's not like it's not like you can walk down the street and say, "Oh, that that looks like a Twitcher over there." <laughs> or I don't even know. I don't even know what you would call the the group of people on Twitch. Um, it's kind of hard. The point is, it's kind of hard to make a stereotype when there's no outward characteristics that look different about a person. So yeah, anyway, let, let's move on in the, in the program here. There was no notion of race. <laughs> people could look at other people and see some people were lighter and some people were darker, but what did that mean? What did that mean? Greeks, notably Herodotus, uh, fifth century BC, uh, Herodotus traveled. Uh, we don't know that he actually traveled to all the places that he talked about, but he did talk about what was then the known world, his known world. And uh, he did not use the word race, but he talked about how people live, uh, where people live, the climate, is the air ah. humid or dry, uh, ah. is the landscape... Is that your nomination for uh, Twitch um, stereotypes? Is they're all debate bros? <laughs> That's a good one, Mouse Lander. Um, yeah, hopefully I don't come off as a debate bro. Although I do like debating, I like arguing with people online. I, I I'm not really doing it <laughs> as like a blood sport. Uh, it's more just because I want to put out the ideas that I think are the best. Um, but most of what I do is not even debates at all. That's, that's, that's good, though. I like that. 
debate bros. That's that's the the harmful stereotype of of people on Twitch. <laughs> yeah. Hilly or flat? Is there a lot of work around? How do the people live? Do they live on horseback? Uh, do they walk around? And how do they look? They could see differences in skin color. So, for instance, uh, Ethiopian comes from burnt skin. Actually, Herodotus Jeez. thought that the That's Ethiopians bad. were the handsomest people in the world, yeah. um, kind of as an aside. So if race didn't exist for the Greeks, does that mean they saw all humans as equal? Uh, no. For culture, um, the ancient Greeks naturally thought that their culture was the best. Just pause one second there. Um, Aliosha says, lighter versus darker skin tones. All humans have prejudices. And that's true. That's why I personally think it's a, a, a useful and important difference to separate prejudices from racism. Because for me, racism has an extra characteristic that it's like I have bad feelings about you even though I don't know you and I can do something about it, Right. Um, it's like the, the Karen, how Karen has, has been used for white women that weaponize their race against usually black men, but, but people of color all over the place. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, a Karen possesses racism when she's not only having prejudice, but being able to back that up with sometimes police force, which equals deadly force potentially, uh, to me, that's that's the difference between just having prejudice. Anyone can be prejudiced against anyone. I've, I've heard all sorts of prejudices against white people. Um, but like even with the, the C word debate rate recently, and the only reason I'm not saying that is because of, it apparently is against Twitch's terms of service now. But the in, in m most conversations, I wouldn't have any problem saying the C word against white people because it really doesn't hold the same currency. It doesn't have the same bite as the N-word, which hopefully if you're a decent human being, you don't say at all the full form of that word. And that's that kind of highlights, again, the difference between having just prejudice, just racial prejudice, and racism. Racism is, is the ability to act on it. It's if the police show up to break up a fight, who's going to be automatically believed to be in the, on the side of right knowing them, them knowing nothing about you prior or anything else about you you know having you know both of you dressing in the same ec socioeconomic class are they going to take be more likely to take the side of the white person or the black person in in a given fight um that's that that to me is is what racism is about and also it's stuff that's more institutionalized as well Things like redlining, which was a thing up until, I believe, the 80s, um, where legally you could say, um, as a bank, I don't want a loan to, pe to black people trying to move into this neighborhood. I'm going to deny you your loan, even though you're, you're qualified, based on your skin color. That's redlining. And it may not even be explicit. They may just say no and come up with an excuse about it, which is one reason it's hard to get rid of because there's almost always some other excuse you can throw up rather than racism. And that's in fact a, a tactic that various white power groups have taken on. I read a book recently uh, about the white power movement called Bringing the War Home, which I highly recommend. And it talks about how you'll see, depending on how in vogue it is to be overtly racist at any given point, white power groups will switch to being anti-communist and then they can just label as communist any race or group of people that they don't like. Um, it's a it's a way of dog whistling. But but back to what I was getting at. Um, actually, I don't remember. <laughs> I've gone off on a tangent, and I don't remember exactly what I was uh, getting at. Um, oh yeah, redlining. So so redlining that that get, went up into the eighties. And there was also racial covenants that went up until fairly recent decades where you could say that not only am I not going to sell my house to anyone who is a different race than I am, but no one after me can either forever. That was that was, there's literal racial covenants about that. 
Uh, in fact, one of the, the, the neighborhood that I primarily grew up in at one point had an anti-Jewish racial covenant. You could not sell your house to a Jewish person uh, ever, ever. It doesn't matter how many you know times the house has changed hands. You can never sell your, your house to a Jewish person in that neighborhood. Eventually, that was ruled un unconstitutional. Absolutely rightly so. Uh, but it took a while. And, you know, if I were a, a Jewish person, um, my kids would be the first Jewish people, or the first generation, that is, to, to be born after that covenant went away. So that could probably still have an effect on their lives, right? Same thing with redlining, you know? In fact, my parents were born about a decade and a half before most of the civil rights legislation. So if I were a black person, I would be the first generation. I'm, you know, I'm only just 39 years old. I would be the first generation to be past, to, to live in a world, to be born into a world that was past the worst parts of Jim Crow. Uh, do you think that might have an effect on me if I were a black person, knowing that my parents were, were alive and, and almost adults by the time that those, the Jim Crow is dismantled? Probably so. It, it's not as though you just, you know, you pass a piece of legislation and it, it flips a switch and everyone is, you know, singing kumbaya together in racial harmony. It, it takes a long time for these things to wane as, as an effect on a particular group. Um, even today, there are still rules in place, laws in place that while they're not overtly racist, have an absolutely racist effect. One of those being the way that schools are funded, you know, schools everywhere in the country, as far as I know, are divided into school districts and then funded by the taxpayers within those districts. It's, it's taken, that's where your property tax goes. So, uh, all you have to do if you want to keep a racial group down is to put them all into the same school district. And just through the inertia of history, they're going to be less likely to have accumulated wealth as a whole. They're still going to be, on average, less wealthy. So that's going to be less tax dollars going into the, the pot for that school district. And having bad, you know, having a subpar education is definitely a factor in the outcome of your life. It's not as though it's impossible to overcome, but it takes a whole lot more effort and a whole lot more time and energy to get to the same place that people that just were born into a better school district naturally get, you know. So it's, it's, it's like starting a race, but you're, you know, you have to start 20 yards back. You could maybe still win. And there's a lot of guys, there's or girls too as well. There's a lot of any sort or any gender of person who wouldn't have a problem beating everyone 20 yards back, starting 20 yards back. But on average, the outcome is going to be that if you have a head start, you're going to finish first. You're going to get to that spot where you are financially independent uh, and have a lot less problems that are associated with not being financially independent. So that's where the systemic racism comes in. That, that these, that these are systems that are put in place that, that even if no one in that system has a racist bone in their body, because they're enacting policies that have disparate outcomes on certain racial groups, the outcome is still racist. That's, that's what systemic racism is in a nutshell. It's how do these policies affect racial groups on average? And if you have one racial group that on average starts at a lower rung in the economy than another racial group, just having a policy that affects poor people more is going to have a racist outcome because it affects one race more. There doesn't even have to be a racial intention behind it. It's just a fact of life. It's, it's a de facto racist policy. Right. You might compare it to um, just using a class example. It is equally illegal for a rich man and a homeless person to sleep under an overpass. 
but really what's the effect of that policy saying that it's illegal to sleep under an overpass? It's, to, it's, it's going to affect the homeless person. It's not going to affect the other person. So that policy could be said to be anti-homeless, even if there's not the word homeless in that policy at all. Even if it's just the simple words, it is illegal for anyone to sleep under an overpass. You will be removed if you do. Doesn't contain the word homelessness. Obviously anti-homeless. And obviously the effect is going to be making it harder to be a homeless person. Which is already a, in, in which you are already in a difficult position in the first place. Same sort of thing, only with race. Um, and oftentimes those those things are intertwined. All right, I've been missing some comments here, so let's let's catch up. Let's see what people have been saying. Do do okay. So, so Mouse Lander says, debate bros are condescending, aggressive, and more than statistically wrong about everything. Oh, isn't that the case? Isn't that the case? There, there's some rare exceptions. If you really want to see some really good debate bros, I would suggest checking out um, Shark 30 Zero. Uh, actually, that's that's the one that really comes to mind. I I, I like Dylan Burns, even though I, I disagree with his politics. He's, he's definitely pro-capitalist. But he's good at debating, and he's not a dick about it. So there's another one, Dylan Burns TV, you can check out. Uh, but yeah, more often than not, it's being very confident and very good at rhetoric, so that even if you're out of your depth, you can kind of, you know, bob and weave your way like a like like you're a boxer and still score a lot of points. Yeah, I I, I like Shark more than more than most really. Like I think he has good takes. And he seems to have a lot more compassion than your average debate, bro. So I, I think that's a plus for him as well. Demon Mama uh, also comes to mind. Um, I don't think I've agreed with her on every take that she's had, but definitely seems to actually care about the issues and care about her opponents and, and not just be looking to demolish and destroy. So there's a few out there. You just, you really got to look through it. <laughs> uh, but more often than not, they're young white, middle-class, uh, cis, het guys who have an opinion, maybe have taken a philosophy class so they can be like, actually, that's a logical fallacy. And, you know, actually, you've, you've uh, misinterpreted the word uh, optimist. That's not how it's used in philosophy. And therefore, I win. And just stuff like that. Hello, hello, Sam. How are you tonight? Good to see you. We were talking about how whiteness was created. Um Although I think I'm pausing a little bit too much because it is a fairly long episode. So I'll try to I'll try to catch up with the, the chat and then we'll move on. Oh, Massachusetts was until 1995, you say, Ali Osher. See, it's it would be that would make that would make virtually every millennial uh who 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 was born in Massachusetts virtually every millennial would have been born before redlining was abolished finally. So that's, if you're a black person, that's probably still going to have an impact on your family and where you find yourself, what school district you find yourself in, what opportunities there are for you, how much crime there is in your area, uh, how many jobs, how many high quality jobs there are. It's going to have an effect on a lot of stuff. I mean, when it comes down to it, housing is one of the most critical things for any human being to to flourish, having secure housing. Um, so being able to affect where a person literally can live, regardless of, of any ability they have, you know, you know, th throw capitalism aside entirely and, and ability to pay, that's going to have a big outcome on your life and the life of your children. So that, that's incredible that it went to 95. That's absurd. Yeah, the list of despicable characteristics is long. That's right, Mouse Lander. True. I don't I don't mean to to downplay prejudice altogether, Alyosha. Prejudice can have bad effects all over. It's just that one you know, racism by contrast can be weaponized to have 
a disproportionate effect on the person that it's it's being directed against. But yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not an advocate for just having prejudice. Like, you know, get to know people on a personal level. Um, so, so yeah. Yeah, don't 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 mistake it and think that I'm defending prejudice. I, I don't like prejudice either. I just think racism is a lot more pernicious. That's all. And you're right, Natalie. Property tax based on the home's market value can drastically affect a local school and even getting and keeping good teachers and staff. And the racial makeup can drastically affect how a property is assessed in its value just through that just through that sort of prejudice uh people will assume that that a a, a highly mixed neighborhood or a highly non-white ethnic neighborhood that that things are going to be lower value and that's going to translate into less taxes and poorer school districts so i mean the, the only way around it really is to at the very least go state by state and say collect all the state tax all, all the um property taxes into one pool and then distribute it evenly across every school district in the state based on number of students that's really the only fair way to get around that issue but it still is something that that can affect people today Yeah, uh, David, uh, David Evans, I, I appreciate your comment. You're saying that uh, racism and prejudice continue existing, but racism is a strong belief about the value of a, a, a people from different ethnic backgrounds. I look at it a little bit differently. I say that prejudice is just having, you know, you're prejudging somebody. You're, you're assuming things about them based on immutable characteristics that, that appear to you, and you, you don't even know that those apply to them. Um, it's not as though anyone has perfect, you know, uh, clocking capability for, oh, this is a white person, this is a black person. Sometimes you're going to get it wrong. So, so you know, it prejudice goes beyond even correctly identifying people. Uh, but I think racism has the, the added pernicious characteristic that you have the power to do something about it. Oh, Turing News, thank you so much for the raid. Hello, welcome in. Raiders, um, go check out Turing News, everybody. Let me just shout you out. Really great channel. I always love some, some Turing News. So yeah, check them out. Uh, they've been doing uh, stuff about permaculture a lot. Uh, uh, that's that's some of the last videos that I've I've watched of theirs on the on the uh, urban farm that that they were setting up. So I've been really interested to see that and, and how that's coming along. So how are you doing tonight? So you say uh, touring news that you're having a nice night. We were on a quiet one, reading through Substack articles. Oh, cool, cool. Well, welcome in everybody. Welcome. I am I'm Bread Theory. I I talk about. I usually do uh, streaming of of political audiobooks, leftist political audiobooks. Right now we're in the middle of Alexander Berkman's The ABC of Anarchism, which is also known as What is Communist Anarchism? Um, it's a really introductory book about kind of the, the idea of what it means to be an anarchist, at least according to Berkman. So that's been good. I, I do that on Wednesdays. And then on Sundays, I kind of do whatever I feel like. Um, so tonight we're looking at how the concept of whiteness was constructed and, and why it was constructed. Uh, we're listening to a podcast from Seen on Radio, and it was a series called Seeing White. And the, this episode is is going into the history of of how white people became a thing, because it wasn't always that case. Uh, it was only very recently that white people were even thought of as any sort of group that had anything in common. Before that, people would identify as as whatever region, or maybe even whatever village they came from. Uh, more, you know, there was no such thing as black or white or any of that sort of thing. It was, it was more ethnically defined um, or culturally defined. All right. <laughs> uh. 
Uh, white is a racial slur, says Mouselander. Pestiny told him so. <laughs> oh, man. It's, it's only a matter of time before some super edgy debate bro comes up with that take. Just waiting for it. Anyway, I think we can get back into uh, the... Oh, thank you for following Driving Alone with Mask. Good to have you in. We we're talking about how white was, whiteness was created. Um, anyway, let's get back into the podcast and, and we'll see what they have to say. And that they were the civilized people and other people were barbarians. The Ethiopians to the south who happened to be darker, good looking or not, they were barbarians. But so were the pasty people to the east. The Persians, for instance, were light-skinned, and they were too light-skinned for uh, upper-class Greeks who played their games in the nude and got suntanned. And they would laugh at Persians for spending too much time indoors. And the in indication of that was that the Persians were really light-skinned. They didn't go outside and get suntanned. They were unhealthy. The Greeks saw lesser humans in every direction. To the northwest, the Celts. That word, Celt, comes from the Greek name for the Celts, Keltoi, which meant roughly the strange barbarian people to the west. And to the northeast of Greece, the Scythians, a loosely defined term that seems to have applied to people we would now call Slavic, but also Asian. The Greeks decided all those non-Greeks were inferior, not because of the color of their skin or anything hereditary, but because of where and how they lived. Oh, and uh, yes, in the ancient world, there was a whole lot of slaving going on. Yeah. Slavery is so much bigger. Slave trades are so much bigger than our idea of race. The Greeks, the Romans, the Chinese, the West African kingdoms, they all practiced forms of slavery. The Vikings, all that pillaging they were known for, one of the main things the Vikings pillaged was people. And people of every color got enslaved. Folks in Eastern Europe were hauled off into bondage so often and for so many centuries that the very word slave derived from their name. Yeah, Slav. But if all that slavery in the ancient world was not about race, because race hadn't been invented yet, well, who did invent it? I just want to pause quickly. So a lot of times you'll, you'll come into uh, some apologia for the North American slave trade, uh, which, which was, you know, chattel slavery of mostly black people uh, brought over from Africa. And, and people say, well, they'll talk about what they were just talking about here. Oh, well, there's been slavery in every culture since uh, back, you know, you know, thousands of years ago. And so, so, you know, why are we talking that much about slavery here and stuff? Well, it's because if it's truly an evil thing, then it doesn't matter if it happened to a lot of people. For one thing, that doesn't make it right for it to happen here. And that, that should be pretty obvious to anyone. But also, there's a big difference between, you know, conquering people and then taking some of them as slaves and having uh, rules about how you can keep them and usually it not beating, slavery not being a hereditary trait. So like if they have children, at the very least, their children will be free. There's a big difference between that and chattel slavery, uh, which meant that if you were taken into slavery in the in the U.S. and brought to the U.S. or the Americas, your children were also slaves. Anyone that, that was born from a, a slave woman would end up being a slave themselves. So there's a big difference there. That's, that's an extra dimension of cruelty. Um, and then also various formulations of slavery meant things like, you know, you were a slave for a certain number of years and then you could be freed or you become a member of the family. It wasn't all anywhere near as, as brutal and, and dehumanizing as chattel slavery, which literally viewed people as property, as, as not even being human beings. So there's, there's that as well. So it's basically just a big whataboutism to bring up any sort of other slavery when we're talking about issues with American slavery. Um, and it should really not be taken too seriously. Yeah, yeah, every civilization, you could say. And that's not entirely true. Um, I just read David Graeber's new book, uh, The Dawn of Everything, and it seemed as though there were a, there was quite a few civilizations in North America that 
for whatever reason, never had a, a stage where slavery was acceptable. Um, and I would assume that would be true throughout the world, that there's been plenty of civilizations that just didn't have that, that in, you know, as, as a part of who they were. And, and whether that's because the civilization wanted to distinguish themselves, I can't remember the term he used for that, that cultural trait, but the idea is that we don't want to be like our neighbors, so we're going to do things opposite of them. Um, so that could be a factor. It could just be that they thought about it ahead of time and consciously said, well, no human being should be treated this way, even our enemies. Uh, so I don't think it's entirely inevitable that, that, that every civilization goes through a slavery stage. But at the same time, again, the ones that do don't justify other ones that do. It's not as though you can just say, well, they did it. So it's, it's not great, but it's okay because everybody does it. You know, that's, that's, that, that's, doesn't make any sense logically. It would be like saying every civilization has murderers, so it's okay for us to murder, right? Obviously, that's untrue. <laughs> every civilization, to one extent or another, has said that you cannot just kill other people for any reason you feel like. Um, so, yeah, one evil does not justify another. So it's okay to call both evil. It's okay to condemn them both in the same way. And that's really the point. Are you reading it too, Mouse Lander? It's a great book. I, I just finished it. I think it was one of the last books I read of, of 2021. So yeah, man, very eye-opening. And it, 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 you know, it really shows that there's no inevitable arc of any civilization, that, that people do have agency as a collective, and we don't have to make choices just because others have. We don't have to accept capitalism as inevitable. We don't have to accept it as the end of history either. Plenty of other civilizations in North America and, and elsewhere have had various forms of what would be considered very close to ideas of communism or anarchism. Uh, and some reverted back and some went forward or, or just ended as a civilization altogether. So there's no... Civilization is not just a timeline that goes from where well, you start with this, you move to chiefdoms, you go up into monarchy, then you go through to capitalism, and you finally get, are, are only then able to get to a socialist state of any kind. Um, it's a lot more complex than that, and there's a lot of more factors at play than just the inevitable march of time. But yeah, great book. Highly recommend that one. Let's get back into the, the podcast, though. And when? Going into this, I did not expect an answer to that question in the form of one person's name and the year of the invention. But here's a scholar who says, yeah, I'll tell you who did it. So, yeah, my name is Ibram Kendi, and I'm an assistant professor of history at the University of Florida. Ibram Kendi's book, Stamped from the Beginning, no. The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America, won the National Book Award for Nonfiction in 2016. You, you'll probably recognize that name, too. Um, he had a book recently. In fact, let's look it up. Ibrahim X. Kennedy. Oh, Kendi, excuse me. Let's see. Anti-racist. That was his book recently. Anti-racism. And I think that, that book came out after this particular podcast. Um, yeah, he should be should be familiar anyway. Before we get to the guy Kendi blames for inventing race and racism, a little more context that he offers about the ancient world. Yes, he says, people have always had the tendency to see themselves as the very best sort of people, Aristotle built a human hierarchy based on climate theory, which claimed that the sort of temperate region of the Mediterranean uh, has produced the most superior peoples, while the extreme cold or extreme hot northern or southern climates sort of lead to these inferior peoples. But Kendi points out that not everybody thought that way, even back then. Just as you had these notions of human hierarchy in the pre-modern world, in the ancient 
uh, world, so too did you have individuals like Aristotle's uh, chief foe in Athens. Uh, He's talking about a philosopher named Alcadamus. Well, then just on its face, that's a ridiculous notion that that climate and geography are going to be the only factors that determine how a civilization organizes itself. Because even within Greece, you have very different civilizations of, of say, Athens and Sparta that lived in pretty much the same place under pretty much the same climate. And you'll find this throughout the world, throughout history. Different civilizations take different paths, even though they have similar geographies, similar levels of material wealth and ability to make war, all that, you know, similar technological levels. So that's a really dumb way to organize why, in your mind, why some civilizations advance more than others or are better, quote unquote, than, than others. I just, it's silly. It doesn't make any sense to me. Who challenged those notions? Aristotle said nature intended for some people to be enslaved by others. Alcadamus wrote that God has left all men free. Nature has made no man a slave. And likewise, Kendi says, Just like you had some uh, Christians uh, using Christianity to, to justify certain peoples as inferior, so too did you have St. Augustine and other early Christian fathers who, who challenged those notions and, and expressed uh, human equality. Throughout history, he says, there have always been thinkers who understood that humans are one. And there have always been people with the capacity to admire cultures and societies different from their own. Kendi points to a man named Ibn Battuta, a Moroccan born in 1304. Yeah, Ibn Battuta, who was basically is considered to be the 14th century's greatest world traveler. And so he traveled all the way over to, to Asia, uh, up and through Eastern Europe, into Middle East. He also traveled into Sub-Saharan Africa. And he, of course, wrote about his travels and described uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, specifically the Mali uh, Empire, uh, which was, the, so you had these three major sort of empires in pre-colonial West Africa, Ghana, Mali, and Songhai. Some argue Mali was the most illustrious and the richest. And so he, he visited Mali and, and spoke quite glowingly about Mali and how, for instance, that, you know, he traveled many places, but in Mali, you know, he felt safer than anywhere else. He also uh, spoke about sort of the civilization of the people and other things of that sort. And when he went back to to Morocco and, and wrote that, some of the armchair intellectuals thought he, he must be lying. Batuta's claims about the glories of Mali were shouted down as lies for a very practical reason. His Islamic Moroccan society was busy enslaving people from sub-Saharan Africa, as well as Slavs from Eastern Europe. And so to classify these people as not inferior would have been, uh, of course, uh, difficult for slave traders, just as if people didn't classify the Slavs as inferior, it would have been bad for business as well. About a century after Ibn Battuta wrote admiringly about West African kingdoms, a Portuguese man wrote a book. And here we get to Ibram Kendi's culprit. His name was Gomez de Zurara. As Kendi recounts, the king of Portugal had hired Zurara to write a biography of the king's uncle, Infante Enrique, better known as Prince Henry the Navigator. Who, of course, was the first major uh, slave trader to exclusively enslave and trade in, in African people from, of course, Portugal in, in the mid-1400s. Uh, Writing in 1453, Zarara chronicles and glorifies Prince Henry's historic voyage a decade before. It was the first time Europeans... just want to interject, too. Um, talking about that kind of triangular slave trade route where, where a lot of slaves were captured in Africa, routed through places like Portugal, and then sent to the Americas. That's another sticking point that, that a lot of, you know, um, slavery apologists will like to point to. It's like, oh, you know, it wasn't just the, the, the white people in America that were culpable for it. You know, how about those, those African uh, 
chieftains and kings who were enslaving other people and, and putting them into the slave trade? And how about the Portuguese who were also responsible for the slave trade? It's, it's all just trying to uh, obfuscate the fact that, yes, there were many terrible people involved with it. And yes, each had some degree of culpability. But ultimately, the people that far and away benefited the most were white American plantation owners. So, uh, I mean, it was to the point where, you know, major cities in the South really didn't get going until after the slave trade had, had been destroyed because these people had so much wealth and so little need for any sort of pool of labor because they had labor in the form of slaves that there just wasn't as an as much of a need for a, you know a large civilization so that's one reason that civilizations in in the north where slavery was less common not necessarily illegal but but less common uh you'd have larger centers of population because they needed more people to work in the factories and that was that's another factor as well is that the north focused on factory work which required i guess more labor than than agricultural work um but it should be pretty obvious to anybody who, who spends more than half a second thinking about it that, of course, the, <laughs> the white people in the U.S. benefited from slavery and were most, uh, you know, most culpable for the entire thing. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it's like saying, you know, um, I, uh, it's like buying a sweatshop product and saying that you have no culpability in buying that product well i mean maybe if you're poor you don't have a better option than buying uh, a garment that's made from sweatshop labor but if you have the money then yeah that that labor didn't have to to serve you at all so just because someone else is employing the people in the sweatshop um for little to no money and you know you just happen to be the end product recipient that doesn't take you out of the entire equation or make you less culpable assuming you have any sort of choice in the matter. So Alyosha says, uh, slavery is wrong. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that, that's about as basic as you can get. I, I, I'd say there's absolutely no justification for it uh, in any time or any place that it has occurred. Um, even we're talking about like modern day prison slave labor, which still exists due to the, the loophole in the 13th Amendment, <laughs> which you can go look up. Um, in fact, let's read the exact text of the 13th Amendment, just for better reference. Uh, let's take a look. 13th Amendment to the Constitution. Uh, neither slavery... Oh, let's see. Let's read the whole thing. Okay, here we go. So... Passed by Congress January 31st, 1865, ratified December 6, 1865, the 13th Amendment changed a portion of Article 4, Section 2. Section 1, neither slavery nor in involuntary servitude, what really is the distinction there? I don't know, but except, except as punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. That loophole, that except, means you can legally enslave people in prison. Now, many states have outlawed that practice, but there are still some that, that literally force their, their in, prison inmates to do labor for no money. Not for just a little bit of money, but for no money. Um, and I would argue that even if you're giving them 13 cents a day, that's not really materially different than, you know, not paying them at all especially with the jacked up prices in prison commissaries, so on and so forth. But slavery was never fully abolished in the United States, so that's important to keep in mind. Prisoners can still be enslaved, and I would argue that that, just on its face, is wrong. I don't care what the person has done. There should be no way that you can turn a human being into a piece of living machinery, right, to work in whatever factory that they're they're working in or whatever endeavor they're, they're working at so i would agree ali slavery is just wrong on its face and then he also goes on to say plus america and england and israel have legal documents about liberty yep 
So that should apply to people who have been imprisoned as well. So slavery is and should be uh, hypocritical. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, you look at the founding documents of this country, like, uh, you know, all, we, we find these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Well, they literally meant men at that time, not women. And they literally were thinking of white men who owned property. They just didn't spell that out. But legally, as this country, the U.S., was started, those are the only people that were allowed to vote. So you did not have any sort of universal suffrage at that point. Uh, so, I mean, it's little wonder why our country is so conservative even till today because it's taken so many hundreds of years to peel back uh, and get towards, you know, everyone actually having equal rights. Um, first making it so that people that don't own land are allowed to vote uh, and then making it so uh, women can vote and then making it so all races can vote and, and, you know, so on and so forth. And there's still struggles today with, with some pretty shady and underhanded tactics to disenfranchise voters, not least of which is, you know, not having voter holidays and that sort of thing, making it so that working people, although they technically are allowed to ask for uh, enough time off to vote, that's a nebulous term right there. How much is enough time? Well, it depends on how far your home and polling place is from your place of work. If you have a two or three hour commute, that just may not be feasible at all. Um, but definitely the, the, the push is still towards having middle and upper class people be the primary people that vote just it's structurally it's put in place that way i would argue on purpose because they don't trust poor people to make good decisions they certainly don't trust people in prison to make good decisions which is why in many states that once you once you become imprisoned for a felony you or i guess sometimes even if you're convicted of any felony uh you lose your right to vote and you may not be able to get it back um so it's pretty intentional what this country was formed around and what it still continues to try to push towards, even though some of those rights have been clawed or some of those privileges that were enjoyed, enjoyed only by, uh, you know, white wealthy landowners in the past. Some of those privileges have been clawed away from them, you know, over the centuries. So, so, so Sam says it makes you think of what Lee Atwater said in them tapes. Lee Atwater. I'm trying to, oh, 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 oh. Um, yeah, that basically you, you, you're talking about how you can't be overtly racist, but you can certainly dog whistle. Yeah, you can't be overtly classist. You can't say that poor people can't vote, but you can sure make it really hard for them to vote. You can certainly make it really hard for black people to vote by doing things like just kind of across the board voter purges, um, you know, days or weeks before an election, uh, stuff like that. Oh, the Southern strategist. Yeah, yeah. You can dog whistle all these things to say, oh, these are the, really the people we want in charge still, but we're not going to say it outright because that makes us look bad. We have plausible deniability, that sort of thing. Mauslander says that in Denmark, prisoners do not lose any civil rights. That should be how it is everywhere. You're a human being, and the decisions that are made, if we're going to even pretend to have you know, a full functioning democracy, the decisions that are made affect you. Well, I guess in any government system, the decisions that are made affect you. So you still should have a say. There should be nothing that, that can give up your right to have a say on how laws are crafted, especially ones that affect you directly. So that's, that's just kind of ridiculous. Um, let's see, I missed one other one there. Uh, so, so, so Mouse Lander continues, uh, that is except, uh, freedom of movement. Well, of course. Yeah. Prisoners can vote, but they, they give up no other rights. Uh, they give up no other rights than their, their freedom of movement, which is, I guess, by definition, what a prisoner is. You don't have unrestricted freedom. Stoop Kid says a wide variety of companies such as Whole Foods, McDonald's, Target, IBM, Texas Instruments, Boeing, Nordstrom, Intel, Walmart, Victoria's Secret, 
Aramark, AT&T, BP, Starbucks, Microsoft, Nike, Honda, Macy's, and Sprint, and many more actively participated in prison insourcing throughout the 90s and 2000s. Yeah, these, these giant corporations especially benefit tremendously from, from very reduced uh, prison wages or just having it out, be outright slavery, right? Um, yeah, that, that's, that's always kind of been one of, one of capitalism in the U.S.'s dirty secrets is they depend very much on people getting screwed over as workers. Uh, and not just not getting paid a great wage, but getting paid less than minimum wage. You know, it's the same thing with, with agricultural businesses relying on migrant, uh, often illegal labor that they can then say, work for less than minimum wage or we'll deport you. Things like that. Uh, yeah, immigrants having a job should be, anyone having a job should be allowed. I think there's a good argument for allow for saying that the age that you are allowed to be employed should be the age that you start to get a say, to start to get to vote. Uh, if if nothing else, it it gets people more used to participating in our supposed democracy here, right? Um, even even if it was just like once you reach the the age. Uh, or even if it was just something like um, trying to get more young people who can't yet vote involved in the, the process by being election workers of one kind or another, I think that would be a great thing to do. Uh, is someone has their... their... Is that's not me. <laughs> that's, li that's literally... I'm on the, like, the third floor here. That's someone out in the parking lot in their car. <laughs> I think they have their car stereo turned up a little bit too high. Uh, anyway, moving on. So, so John says, and immigrants having a job. Yeah, yeah. That, I just read that. Should be able to vote. Totally agree. Even people that aren't are are not so-called legal immigrants. Laws affect them tremendously. They should probably be enfranchised as well. Uh, I think, yeah, residency should be about all that it takes to be able to vote, whether that residency is a college dorm room or a prison or, you know, an apartment complex, whatever it is. If you can prove that you are a resident at all in any way, you should have the right to vote. That seems like a pretty basic right to me. Uh, Sam says the amount of people that Republican senators represent versus the number of people that Democratic senators represent is proof that of voter suppression. Absolutely. And, and that gets into a lot of things like gerrymandering, which if, if, for those that don't know, is the idea that, uh, every so often, every, every few years, the, the voting districts are changed. Um, and like at the, at the federal level, Certain states that have lost population may lose seats in Congress, and certain states that have gained population proportionally will, will pick up those seats. So you have to redistrict everything. You draw out the districts again. Now, if you're in charge at the time of districting, you have a pretty big incentive to lock in any advantage you get. So you can do things like, you know, say there's a really strong Democratic district and you don't want them to even have any representatives. You could take portions of that, that district and fold it into other surrounding Republican strongholds uh, to the point where none of them have a majority, even though they would win a majority if they were their own district. So you could, that's called cracking. So that's one way. There's, there's cracking and there's packing, and those are the two most common things. The other thing is if there's a whole bunch of current districts that, that all are close to having 50% Republican, 50% Democrat, you can, you can redistrict things so that all of those uh, portions that are, are uh, leaning Democrat are packed into one district so that they only win one district rather than 50% of the districts and Republicans take the rest. That's, a, that's another way of doing it. So gerrymandering is a huge deal. And that happens with school districts as well. That, that's, that's pretty... Uh, that's about as close as you're going to get to overt racism in terms of public policy, because the, the idea is almost always with, with school district gerrymandering to put all of the problem so-called so students into the same districts. So you district things in a way that you don't have to deal with 
the black and brown children. Um, my, 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 uh, my wife's district just got in trouble for that recently. So it's something that still continues to this day. Um, yeah, it's, it's really insidious stuff, but, uh, once again, it goes to show that, that racism, though it be a social construct, still has a lot of important real-world impacts for everybody. Yeah, institutional racism is one way that, that um, racism is expressed in redistricting. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Let's continue on in the podcast here sailed to sub-Saharan Africa to seize captives directly rather than buying so sub-Saharan slave slaves trade just to get you from back North on African track. middlemen. In describing the resulting slave auction back in Portugal in 1444, Zurara lumped together the very different looking captives, some lighter-skinned Tuareg people, others much darker. He claimed that Prince Henry's main motive was to bring them to Christianity. So Zarara portrayed slavery Always as a an improvement over freedom in Africa, where he wrote, They lived like beasts. They had no understanding of good, but only knew how to live in bestial sloth. And, and so I basically uh, make the case that he was the first articulator of racist ideas. And in order for him to articulate racist ideas, he had to basically combine all of the different ethnic groups that Prince Henry was enslaving into one people and then describing that people as as inferior. So, so there you have it. From its very first inception, dividing people by race was a tool used to justify the enslavement of one and the rule of another. Uh, so so with with <laughs> race and racism are inseparable. You can't you can't you can't there's no good reason to conceive of people this way unless you're then going to say, and therefore we're better than that group or that group is better than this group, so on and so forth. Um, so from the very beginning, the concept of race has, has a, a fraught and, and, and I guess some would say, uh, I, well, everyone should say, a problematic uh, history. And so presumably then he, though he did not necessarily speak as much about whiteness, he certainly created blackness. And uh, blackness, of course, cannot really operate without whiteness. Mm -hmm. And to Kendi, this is crucial. Zarara was not just some independent chronicler calling them as he saw them. As I said before, he was hired to write the book by the Portuguese king, Prince Henry's nephew. And John, you're making some good points. Uh, so you say religion has become slavery where men are gods. That that definitely can be true. And I think it's not coincidental that that oftentimes religion has come in to back up these these sort of racist notions of this person, this group is is more deserving of God's love than that group. Although I will say there's always been counter currents uh, among religions. I, I I try to point out that things like uh, Quakerism was was very responsive was a huge instrumental part of setting up and maintaining the underground railroad they were from their their beginning on this continent were firmly against any sort of separation of people into to these sorts of hierarchies so without the quakers a large portion of the underground railroad would not have been possible right especially since they would be the white people that could use their whiteness as a shield against um, suspicion uh, and against harm uh, to the people that they were sheltering. Um, so religion isn't always a bad thing. It really depends on, on how it's used and why. Uh, the same is true of like the Catholic workers who, from their inception, have been strongly just anarcho-Christians, for lack of a better term. So, uh, yeah, yeah. It, I, that's a good point, John. Quakers view that the, the, the common God is the human soul. So, so it really depends on how you are structuring your religion. I don't understand these... Uh, sorry, I got side. I'm getting stunlocked. Um, I really don't get these people that come in. I'm guessing these are bots that just leave random bits of text 
I think if I had to guess, it would be that they're trying to prove their legitimacy, that they're not bots by, by commenting on a whole bunch of different videos. But I, I've been getting a, a real spate of them lately. Random names that have no, I, I, indecipherable, um, often in Russian. And they just leave this bit of text. And it's always the same thing. It's like three letters and then a dot and then like four more letters. But I don't, I don't get it. Anyway, sorry. Sorry about that sidetrack. I just had to ban a person for doing that. Um, so yeah, so, so it really depends on, on the way a religion is structured at its base, how it's going to relate to things like racism and other sorts of prejudices. So if you conceive your religion from the, the outset that all, all people are con considered equal, uh, it may be tagging the video. I don't really know what it is because I don't, I haven't really gotten any hate raids or anything like that. So there's nothing that's really come of it necessarily. Um, and when I block them, that deletes their comments. So I don't know. I don't know what the deal is. But anyway, back to it. Um, if you conceive of, of, of your religion saying that all people are considered equal, like if you focus on the parts of the Bible where Jesus is talking about how like, a, a camel has a better chance of walking through the eye of a needle than a rich man has of getting into heaven. And you should sell all your possessions and give them to the poor and, and lead a, a really, uh, a, a life of equality with your fellow human being. And, 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 you know, if, if the person is, is naked, then you should clothe them. If they're hungry, you should feed them, these sorts of things. If that's the part of the Bible you focus on. Well, you can construct a religion around that or a sect of Christianity that, that is going to be more complementary to things like all races are created equal. Like There's no real difference other than very superficial ones between the races. And you're going to be more likely to oppose slavery and Jim Crow and redlining and, and you know, all the myriad of really terrible uh, ways that, that, that racism has been imposed from an institutional level on black people. So... I try not to be too hard on religion and and just see that it's more a reflection of the people that are constructing it and maintaining it more so than the fact that it's a religion or that there's anything inherently bad about any particular religion. Um, cool. All right, let, let's continue on in, in the, the, the show. Zarara was also a member of the Military Order of Christ, which was like this para sort of military slash Christian organization, similar to like the Knights of Templar, and who was the leader of the Military Order of Christ? Prince Henry. And when Prince Henry said something, you were a member, you did it, mm. uh, including make, make him look good for, for slave trading. Sorry, I just wanted to comment on that, that comment by Natalie. That's a good point, too. New Testament, Old Testament, very different ways of, of conceiving of God. You have the, the Old Testament God who is very vengeful, punishing, I mean, literally destroys all of humanity except for a handful of people that, that escape in a boat uh, for being wicked and sinful, um, you know, destroys the, 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 the towns of Sodom and Gomorrah for being evil on and on and like sure you can you can definitely focus on that part and you get some some real fire and brimstone religions coming out of it and the new testament is is more about love thy neighbor and if they if the oh, what is it if the um if your eye offends you pluck it out uh referring to like don't be a horny bastard and think that it's somehow the other person's fault if if you know they're dressing in a scanty, a scantily clad way that, that, that somehow their fault that you're behaving like an idiot, um, these sorts of things. So it really depends on where you focus on how you're going to, to, uh, build up a sect of, of Christianity. We're talking about Christianity mostly in, in particular. Um, but the same thing is true for, for other books or, or other religions of the book, so to speak, uh, Judaism, for example. Yeah, all, all, all religious books have a cultural context and historical context. Very true, Ali. All right, continuing on, though. I think I'm pausing too much, Ali. Let's, let's get through a little bit more. So it's, it's fair to say literally that slave traders commissioned the invention of this sort of codified racist idea of black people and implicitly then on the other hand of white people. Yeah, it's, it's post hoc reasoning. Yes. 
after the fact. Zarara's writings were widely circulated among the elite in Portugal. In the coming years, the Portuguese and their ideas about Africans led the way as the African slave trade expanded among countries like Spain, Holland, France, and England. And then by the 1500s, you had other ideologues expressing similar ideas about African people. So the concept of the beast be becomes sort of the way in which, for instance, the first British slave traders described uh, African people. So, so when the British colonists came to the United States, what would become the United States, they were steeped in these ideas. Is that fair to say? Yes. And so I make the case and I sort of show the pervasiveness of racist ideas um, in England before, uh, in the early 1600s, to sort of show the environment that these colonists were, were brought up in and the racist ideas that were circulating and how not only did they bring over bags, they, they brought up with these racist ideas in their minds. Mm -hmm. By the late 1600s and into the 1700s, with the scientific revolution and the age of enlightenment, scientists got busy sorting the natural world into categories like never before. And they did the same with people. This is Nell Painter again, author of The History of White People. During the Enlightenment, for uh, Carolus Linnaeus' Systema Naturae, it's 1758. And then Jan Friedrich Blumenbach in Göttingen, Germany, first publishing in the 1770s by the 17th. You're asking who's talking? Uh, so, so it might be kind of hard to see, but down in that little corner there, that's the, the uh, podcast that we have pulled up. Uh, this particular woman who's talking is, uh, I think he said that she wrote the history of, of whiteness. Uh, I think I, uh, oh, oh, you want to know the, the source of this here. I'll give you the source again. Oh, why is it not? Uh, let's see if I still have it on my clipboard there. So this podcast is called seen on radio. And here's the particular episode. It's in their series, Seeing White, and this is how race was made. So there's a link for that. Uh, fantastic series. Um, we may actually have time for another episode if you all are up for it. But I think it's like a six-part series. Skipped over the first one because, you know, just from sharing it around myself, uh, the people that I was hoping would be most receptive to it, it felt super offended um, from the get go so they were not really open to it so i, I think th this is the most important of the episodes as far as i'm concerned but there's definitely other ones that are really good too but the first one's more just more or less introductory you know it's like well, the opening line is like what's going on with white people lately and if you're someone who's really sensitive about your whiteness you may not be receptive from that point on if you're like, oh there's nothing wrong with me and that sort of thing you know but this is this is really gets into the heart of things, um, how race was made. That's why I chose it for today. 1880s uh, and the 1790s, using the word Caucasian for white people. Linnaeus named four human races, Blumenbach five. That was just the beginning of an unending argument about how to do the impossible, how to separate humanity neatly into distinct groups. And here too, um, if you're more of a, a visualer, visualer, that's not, that's not a real word, a visual absorber of information, here's a text transcript script of the episode. So you can take a look at that too. Um, if that's, if you just like reading things better than, than listening along. Much later, an American anthropologist would say, no, it's three races. The three in my high school textbook. And I remember, I think I remember even as a, you know, 16-year-old, 17-year-old looking at that and thinking and having questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see, what what about all the people who don't fit neatly into yes. these three, yes. three groups? Yes, and this has always been a problem yeah. for racial science. And, and today that, that has been further complicated by things like ancestry tests and that sort of thing where there's virtually no one in North America doesn't have some sort of ancestry that's that's non-white. So this has been a big problem for, say, leaders of, of white supremacy groups that have taken it and found out, you know, they're they're much more 
mixed than they ever they're conceived of um but yeah that that's the thing that i you know all these 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 various ways that 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 uh um yeah that's true and all everything goes back to africa eventually good point john um but the these these really bizarre ways that that white supremacists and and especially like white separatists like to conceive of their ideal world it makes absolutely no sense because i mean for one thing if you're gonna have a white ethno state how do you determine who gets to be white that's not always been the same thing uh, in the early history of, of the u.s uh, irish were not considered white italians were not considered white i don't think greeks were as, as well uh, possibly even slavic various slavic peoples uh white has only been a way to separate the other so so as time progressed on and it became politically advantageous to say pit the poor irish people against the poor black people in the city you'd say oh white people you know irish people well you know they've done a lot for you know the the, the city or the community and stuff well i mean they're they're basically white people too and so it becomes a it becomes a tool of division that you can use to basically get poor people to fight each other. You get to be part of the in group, so those people, those part of the nasty out group, they're trying to steal your jobs. Don't you just hate that? And and they just they go at it. It it serves the interests of capital very neatly without ever putting the focus on the overall problem that you know only a, a small handful of people in America have ever gotten to have lives that that you know they were completely self-actualized and you can do anything you want go anywhere you want to go and be reasonably assured that you're going to be successful yeah place anyone in the sun and they turn brown and if you do it over enough millennia you're just going to naturally have people that that develop more melanin or if you put them in, in a place that's cloudier or further away from the equator over millennia they're naturally going to just have paler skin and and, and I, I mentioned at the beginning the entire dynamic between why one race is one thing and one race is another is vitamin d absorption versus likelihood of getting skin cancer darker the skin the less likely you are to get skin cancer but the harder it is for your skin to absorb the sunlight that produces vitamin d uh and then the opposite is true for paler skin. The easier it is for you to just go out with like your arms exposed or whatever, you absorb enough vitamin D in like 20 minutes, but it might take three times longer for a person with darker skin. So in the upper latitudes, especially since you don't have as much skin exposed, you have to, to wear some sort of clothing to, to fight off the, the, at least in the, in the colder months, it becomes advantageous to have lighter skin to still get your weekly or daily dose of, of vitamin d that's the entire trade-off that's all it is the only reason that we have adapted to have lighter or darker skin based on where we have migrated to that's it and that's what all of the, all of the racial strife and segregation and, and justifications for slavery all that stems from really basic pragmatic biological solutions to vitamin d absorption versus skin cancer and so oh, again, with the, the skin cancer part of that too, then you have lighter skin, you're more susceptible to skin cancer. So there's that trade-off. That's it. <laughs> it's pretty ridiculous when you break it down that all of that has, has that, that slight variation has fueled all of what it has fueled. Um, moving on. Racial science that we'll be hearing more about in a future episode. But first... Hey, Chandrai, it's me again. Hey. Hey, what's going on, John? How you doing, man? As we established in the introductory episode for the Seeing White series, I'm going to be talking with this friend of mine sometimes to help unpack some of the ideas that come up in the episodes. Chandrai Kumanika, communications professor at Clemson, a scholar, journalist, organizer, artist, <laughs> and a gentleman. I mean, no be no gentleman at all. That's <laughs> it's, it's like Fela, you know what I mean? So I have to tell you, Chandra, I I, uh, I learned so much from these, particularly these these two scholars, professors Painter and Kendi, and their books. 
oh, man, oh. it's just uh, no, it's, some deep scholarship. Dude, it's mind blowing. I mean, it, it, this is what happens when you actually call people who like know what they're talking about, like they're an expert in that in that field. You know what I mean? Because that doesn't always happen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is what happens, right? Like, people think just, you know, like a person is black, you know. I've seen things on race. They, like, pull Kanye. They pull, you know, they might pull Shaquille O'Neal. It's like, wait, why are you interviewing these people to talk about race? That's not that thing. So, you know, whatever I know, I definitely, I can't do what, uh, what Kendi and Painter did. So I'm glad you talked to them. Well, and I couldn't get Charles Barkley's phone number. So. Oh, well, yeah, we, we, we missed yeah. out on that. Well, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so how about this? You know, I think we most of the time we don't, most of us have heard the news about the Genome Project, but I don't think it's really sunk in in the culture at all, has it? That we are, for example, that you and I are, uh, I think geneticists think that every human on the planet is no more than 50th cousins with every other human on the planet. Oh. Uh, we haven't gotten much in the habit of thinking that way, have we? That, that like we're cousins, you and I? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, and in the piece we heard Suzanne Plissick uh, from the Racial Equity Institute say that race is not scientifically real, and yet it's very real politically and, and socially. It's, it's right. kind of a tricky thing to, to make sense of, isn't it? Right. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, I got to say, when I, when I really am putting on, like when I'm being sympathetic, I can kind of understand why it's confusing to people because for people who haven't thought about this on one level, that's what you're trying to get them to understand, right? Like the science, you know, the genes, the genetic diversity. And you're like, listen, you know, scientifically race is like not real. It's not, it's not a thing. But then let's just say I'm talking to, you know, a white person who's the all lives matter crowd, you know, like I'm talking to like a white person right. who's part and he's just like, exactly. So why don't we just stop talking about race? And then it's like, well, no, no, it's actually real yeah. <laughs> and that's confusing you know what i mean that's actually confusing right the person who says so let's see we can stop being concerned about it we can stop talking about it we can stop uh even keeping track of data on how on the different experiences of black people well, you you all need to just stop making a fuss about race if you think if you're going to insist that it isn't real yeah, doesn't work and yeah that, that doesn't work too well does it yeah, I mean, I think that's that's totally wrong, you know, but it is confusing. It's like race isn't real biologically, but it is very real as a as a way that society has been structured. And there's real, you know, the effects of race as a social construct are real. The reason we can't stop talking about it is because we can predict wealth distribution, police killing, uh, all kinds of other, uh, you know, sort of life expectancy factors, health issues based on race, you know, access to schools, because society has been organ organized around a concept that is not biologically real. And then there's another thing about race to me that's, that's also confusing, which is that we want people to understand race as like this systemic thing, like this structural thing that is like in institutions and is in patterns of, uh, you know, the way rights and resources are distributed. And it's like a structural thing. It's not about mm -hmm. just attitudes, like just about, you know, like your distant cousin who's a bigot, right? Right. But we also do you. And, and th this can be very difficult in, especially in American discourse, where we've been so indoctrinated into the, the cult of the individual, where it's super hyper individualistic, where like, you know, we have these, these myths that like, you know, if you just work really hard and you keep your nose down, then you can make it no matter where you come from. Like that's the, that was the original American dream was that no matter where you come from, no matter what, what, uh, the, the struggles of your peoples were, if you work hard, you can make it in America. Never been quite true. There's always been some cases that are outside the norm, but by and large, that's not the case. Uh, where you come from affects very much where you're going to end up. In fact, the, the number one predictor in America of your socioeconomic status when you, you know, when you get to the end of your life, the number one predictor is where you start from. So there, there's some social mobility that's not entirely a myth. Um, it's just that depending on your circumstances, you're going to have to struggle twice as hard just to get to the same spot as your counterparts who didn't have those struggles to begin with. Um, but it's, it's difficult because there's, there's such an emphasis on the individual in the United States that 
it's hard to conceive of racism as anything more than an individual interpersonal problem. It's just like, I don't like you because of your skin color. Uh, and that's, that's what racism is. That's the, the end all be all it's, it starts when you, uh, uh, say a racial epithet and it ends after the racial epithet is out of your mouth. And then you are, you know, that's, that's the end of the racism. Uh, but it's so much more than that. It's the things that we've talked about. It's the, the history of Jim Crow that plenty of people are first or second generation removed from the Jim Crow days. As I mentioned earlier, my parents were born about 15 years before any of the civil rights era, before Jim Crow was finally dismantled and, and schools were integrated. So if I were a black person, I would be first generation to grow up without Jim Crow. Um, I was born after redlining was, or I, I was born before redlining was was abolished finally. So if I were black, I wouldn't even be first generation to live without redlining. My children would be. Uh, so the idea that that you know you remove one racial barrier and everything just equals out and just like snaps back to to an equilibrium within a generation, completely unrealistic. Um, we're only, you know, 60 years from, or not even 60 years from the civil rights era, quite yet. We're still less than, you know, just over 50 years from civil rights legislation. Thank you for the follow, Fruitful Bob. We are, we're talking about how whiteness was created and, and issues with it as a construct. Um, so yeah, like the idea that things are just going to normalize within, even within a generation, kind of ridiculous. Uh, especially since, as as I have mentioned now a couple times, there still is de facto racism in the form of things like school districting, where you can make a district that that happens to be primarily of uh, a non-white race. And just through the statistical likelihood that they're going to be economically disadvantaged, those schools are going to be not as good schools as schools in other districts that are more white. That plays a factor in, in the kind of head start you get in your life going into your adulthood. Socioeconomic conditions in general can, can play a huge factor. The number one cause of domestic disputes is arguing over money. Um, so if you were coming from a, a socioeconomically disadvantaged background, you're more likely to come from a family where there has been domestic strife. It may have been directed towards you as well, much more likely than, than in a sta financially stable family. Uh, plenty of ways that, that race and racism can affect people without having to involve, you know, individual actors saying, uh, I don't like you for your race, therefore I'm going to hold you down. Or even racist legislatures writing legislation that specifically talks about race. Ben Shapiro's big thing is, show me a racist piece of legislation. Show me where it's written that a, a black person can't succeed and a white person can. Well, it doesn't say it exactly, but it has the effect. And that's where the systemic part comes in. It is, it is by effect a racist doctrine if you are doing anything that targets one socioeconomic group over uh, and holds them back against a more wealthier one. Because just statistically, more non-white people are going to be in a lower socioeconomic bracket than white people. So anything you do that, that unfairly disadvantages them or unfairly advantages people that are already rich let's let's look at things like um it's too abstract abstract sam that is that is a good point it's 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 not the visceral one-on-one -on -one, you know hey n-word thing like that's very visceral that's very in your face and obvious it's it's a, these policies that you have to actually think about for a little bit before you can tease out how they are actually racist think about ivy league schools right now legacy uh, can be a factor in whether or not you're admitted to an Ivy League school. So, so if you want to have the best opportunities in the country, get world-class professors, world, and more importantly, meet people that are, are going to be able to open doors in your career in, in the future, uh, 
you want to go to an Ivy League school. But if there, if any of the factors that can be included are, did your parents go there or did your grandparents go there? That shuts the door to people that don't have that legacy. Who is that going to end up being most likely? Most likely people that come from families that, you know, go back to a time not too many generations ago where their race was explicitly not admitted to that school. There was, there was a time where black people explicitly were forbidden from getting into Harvard. And it wasn't that many generations ago. So just little things like that legacy part um, can end up having racist outcomes, even if it doesn't say a damn thing about race. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it doesn't, it, it is abstract in that you're not going to find some smoking gun. Oh, this was obviously created for the purpose of, of holding black people back or, or other non-white people's back. It's more that because you are privileging one group of people over another, it's going to have the effect that black people will continue and non other one, non-white people will continue to be left behind by the effects of, of a particular policy. Um, just getting into housing, getting your, to be able to own your own home, one of the most, you know, what, what, what became the so-called American dream, home ownership of owning your, you know, single family detached house, the white picket fence and, and a lawn, all that stuff. That alone, there, there, there's many facets of that process that can disadvantage non-white people. Uh, you have to have a good credit score. You have to have, be able to save money to put down towards a lot of money. My wife and I are trying to, you know, get on that, that path towards homeownership. Uh, thanks for the follow, Scrub Lord 1963 I feel like you've followed like three or four times now. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, anyway, uh, you, you might not. Have, depending on your, your, your credit and, and history and like that, you might have to have a co-signer, which means you have to have a relative who is in good credit standing. All of these things, well, none of them say race specifically, are going to disadvantage a group of people that are starting from a lower socioeconomic rung on average. So by default, the outcome is racist. And that, that is a lot harder to understand than just, you know, I say one race bad, but it doesn't mean it's any less real or relevant. Uh, it doesn't mean the effect is any less pernicious. In fact, it's usually more, you know, um, it's pretty easy to counter someone who's just being overtly racist because they usually don't have any good reason to back it up. Of course, uh, you, you know, it's, it's, it's on its face, silly to, to say, terrible things about a person based on things that you don't even know about them based on your own prejudices. Cause th that, that's the definition of prejudice. It's prejudging. You don't know anything about them. It's pretty easy to defeat that. It's a lot harder to defeat racist outcomes because you have to establish that it's racist, uh, or that it has a racist outcome. You have to look at all the different mechanisms that contribute to that, all the different factors that contribute it to having a racist outcome. It takes a lot more work mentally and, and then, you know, systemically to change that sort of thing. Um, yeah, class has, is a, it plays a big factor in all of that. And if it just happens to be that, that, that your racial category has been overtly systemically held back for hundreds of years, while other races, well, one race in particular, the white race, the so-called white race, has been able to have all these opportunities available to them for those same hundreds of years, it should be no surprise that today, on average, white people have it better off economically than black people. That's not to say there aren't poor white people. Of course there are. They're more a victim of class prejudice. Uh, but racial prejudice adds yet another facet. It's like the difference between being a homeless white person and a homeless black person. Socioeconomically, like, like, or just on an economic level, they're on the same level. So they're both being equally oppressed economically. But the police are more likely to be terrible 
to that black homeless person than they are to be terrible to the white homeless person. Um, people are going to think that if a white person is homeless, there's a good reason for it. Whereas if a black person is homeless, they're going to believe more like they're more likely to believe that, you know, it's through some fault of, of their own character. Whereas the white person just fell on hard times. It's, it's kind of like the, how whenever there's a mass shooting, uh, before you know the race, you can pretty well predict that whichever race of person it happens to be is going to determine whether or not it's described as a lone wolf incident where some person who's just really troubled, you know, had a really bad day and decided to act out violently and all that's all really empathized with their position or whether it's due to them hating, uh, you know, a, a group of people or, 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 or doing it because they're an inherently bad person. Let's dig into their past and look at their criminal record and, and, and do all we can to paint them as a, a terrible person. You can probably predict that the person that, that, the media is going to treat with the most empathy and and understanding and trying to look into their individual character as much as possible is going to be the white person and the person that, well, this is just, you know, um, a hateful person who uh, isn't just, you know, mentally unstable and uh, um, did things because of... of qualities other than individual qualities, right? White people end up getting to be individuals in that c c scenario and non-white people get lumped into, you know, well, obviously, you know, the, these sorts of people tend to be more violent. That's always the insinuation that's made. So, yeah, um, I think that's, that's probably getting way far afield and I'd like to rein it back into the, uh, more to the topic. Uh, so Sam says, some people go to the extreme and think that all that needs to change are the economic inequalities, and that's it. True, true. Uh, but that would be inadequate. Very true. There's intersectionality where race and economics meet. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. And that can be seen in the disparate ways that people of the same economic standing are treated based on other, Im, you know, based on their immutable characteristics, their race. So obviously, if everyone was equalized in class, there's, there's still going to be a likelihood that one race is going to be treated better than another overall. Um, so yes, economics plays a huge factor. I might even venture to say it's the number one factor that, that keeps certain people down and elevates other people, uh, our economic system, that is. But it's not the only factor. Prejudice would still remain even if everything was equalized and everyone was really given a level platform to start from. It'd be a lot better, for sure, but it wouldn't go away completely. Wouldn't go away completely. Yeah, it's it's history. It's just how you were acculturated as a person um, through the media that you absorb, through uh, the people that you grow up around. Um, these, all things, these are all things that can play a factor in how you view and treat other people regardless of your, your personal socioeconomic standing or theirs either. So that, that's very important. You shouldn't be a complete class reductionist and say that, that if we get rid of class distinctions that everything's going to be perfectly fine and equalized across every other metric. I would assume that trans people will still be marginalized, even if we switch to socialism tomorrow and everyone had a stable platform where all their basic needs were met. There's still going to be transphobia because there's just a lot of cultural animosity uh, floating around just kind of in the ether against trans people. Um, so, yeah. Very, very good point to keep in mind. Yeah, social conditioning, that's a good way of putting it, John. And uh, Sam says that's why Dem Socks and Sock Dems aren't quite there in their total liberation ideology. For sure, for sure. And especially the, 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 the 
uh, social democrats, those that, that don't want to do away with capitalism at all, are fooling themselves to, to think that we can ever uh, patch up the worst damages of, of capitalism to a point where things will be more or less equal across race and uh, all other factors. Good points. But let's get back to the, the podcast. I think we're, we're getting pretty close to the end of this particular episode. We may do another one because we're, well, we may or may not. Use we'll the term of, racist for that we'll too. We'll figure it out. Right? So, so I think that's confusing too right. because those seem like different things to me. Right. And, and that connects, in, and we talked about that last time, and, 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 and it connects in a really significant way with the point that I think Professor uh, Kendi is trying to make in his, with his history of racist ideas in the U.S., which is that he argues that we basically have the cause and effect relationship backwards, right? That we're sort of in the habit of thinking that the problem with race and racism starts with attitudes that people look at other people and and they look different or come from a different place and so there's this tendency to look down on that person or to have prejudice toward them and and therefore to then think well I guess it's okay to exploit or mistreat this person and that's the history of racism that's how this all has happened and his argument is that it that it goes exactly in the other direction Right. I, I mean, and if you think about it, I don't know about you, but that's kind of like the history I sort of grew up on. Right. It was almost like, you know, white people didn't really know. They didn't understand that other people were human. And that's why they mistreated people. But you can't really blame them because once they learned, then, you know, they started treating people better. So, you know, you sort of, you know, can't be mad. They just it was, they, you know, it was ignorance. And it is. It's a weird thing. Like the ignorance is what caused the exploitation. And I think that's totally wrong, right? I think, because if you think about it, you know, when Columbus on his like first and second voyage over to the so-called new world, you know, the mission was exploitation before they even met up with the Arawaks or the Taino Indians, you know, like yeah. the whole issue was we're going to set up colonies and, and try to take land and try to get resources. I'm just gonna say the same thing. Colonialization was the, the, the goal to basically plunder the, the new world for all the resources that they could get their hands on. And so then racism became a, a, a post hoc and, and after the fact justification, uh, rationalization uh, for why that was okay. Because if you just go and start genociding a people, uh, even if you believe them to be inferior ahead of time, at some point someone's going to be like, why are we doing this exactly? How come we're destroying entire people's uh, and they say, oh, oh, because they're inferior. That it becomes the the rationalization for for why. And 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 as they were talking about in the beginning of this episode, the same thing was was true of slavery. It's it's slavery started, and then they needed a reason to justify why it had to keep going in that direction. Why why you know uh, black people were uniquely suited for being chattel slavery, just legally and and conceptually thought of as as property not even people but as any other sort of livestock really that you could uh have on a plantation or an agricultural site uh and and the same thing there's there's a huge parallel between that and kind of class prejudices that that occur especially in countries like america where People, you know, it's it's difficult to really think much about your own position while you're in it, uh, especially if you're constantly being, you're having to work and, and just scrape by and, and struggle and struggle just to survive. It's hard to, to slow down and really think about your position. But once you do, you might start thinking, why is it that my life is so hard and I see these people and their life is so much easier? Why is my boss's life so much easier than mine? Why does he deserve to get to own all this stuff? Will I bust my ass and, and, and don't ever get ahead? At that point, these sorts of capitalist myths come into place. And again, it's a post hoc justification for why some people deserve to be owners and others deserve to be workers. It's it's the things that you see surrounding the cult of Elon Musk, that he's just this genius, like this Tony Stark incarnate, you know, even though he only owns six patents. And when I say owns, he's only named 
on six different patents, all of them related to uh, various Tesla designs and, and the charging station design, um, which, you know, he, he could have just used his wealth and influence to tack his name on there, uh, just like the, the kid who puts their name on the project last minute, even though they didn't contribute a thing. And now they get full credit because their name's on there, right? Even setting that aside, there's there's legions of people that are like, oh, he deserves to have all this money because he's just a, he's pushing the world forward with his big brain ideas, even though what has really come of them other than uh, an electric car company for, you know, that's basically only accessible to the wealthy. Uh, he went to space. Um, he put some tunnels, some one car wide tunnels. I would call them death tunnels underneath Las Vegas only for Tesla drivers to be able to bypass traffic. Um, and I would call them death tunnels because if there's ever a fire or a crash in those tunnels, where are you going to go? Like I, there's barely enough room to open your car door in these tunnels. I've seen people going through them. It's ridiculous. And he's held up as like this, this, this genius, this God among men, this the great man of history that, that, plays into that myth as well. This idea that history is shaped by just a handful of men that stand head and shoulders above everyone else. And with their great vision, they lead everyone else. And that means, of course, that they are justified in having whatever riches come their way. And the rest of us just be so lucky to ride their coattails and, and catch their crumbs as they fall from the bounty that is bestowed to them because, well, they deserve it. And we, the humble peasantry, really, do not. Um, so it's the same sort of post hoc reasoning that goes into why do some people deserve to be bosses and why do some deserve to be owners? And there's other things tied into it. Poor people are inherently lazy. That's, that's another concept that gets thrown in there. Uh, rich people in here, they just work harder than anyone else. So they deserve more. I hear this all the time from small business owners when I argue with them. Well, I built this company. I took the risk, even though the entire system is is set up to mitigate that risk onto all of us socially so that like you can set up an LLC so that no one can come after your personal assets if you do really dumb stuff with your company's money. The worst that can happen is you then lose your company and you have to become a worker again. Uh, there's lots of bankruptcy protections. The fact that Almost never is capital formation just, I saved a bunch of money and then put it into making a business. There's almost always some angel investor that comes along, or they get a loan from a bank, or they just take on invest investors in the traditional sense. Uh, they sell a bunch of people on, on taking on uh, risk in order to invest in their company. So it's not really even their risk at all, but that's kind of, you know... Uh, maneuvered around to justify them then getting the money. And then it's never, when does my risk get paid back? Uh, it's like, if you take a risk one time, then generation after generation of the company even changing hands, like I, I like to use the example of McDonald's. The guy that started McDonald's took that initial risk, whatever it was, whether it was a loan, probably a loan, maybe money from family, whatever it was, doesn't matter, to open that first hamburger stand. That guy's long dead now. He's definitely not the owner. That ownership has changed hands like uh, probably at least two or three times. Do those people get to have all the rewards just because that one guy generations back took the risk? When does the risk idea end? Uh, and therefore, more of the wealth be due or more of the profit be due to the employees themselves. And they never, there's never an answer to that because it's a, it's a bullshit reason. Um, it's just a way to say, shut up, stop criticizing me because there's no actual logic behind it. Even if you were to look at any money that you used of your own personal state, let's say you start a company all on your own. You manage to save up $30,000 or whatever it takes to start your particular, you know, you know start a, a cafe or something like that. Say, say you save up $100,000. You open up your cafe. It's all your money poured into it. Every stick of furniture, the, the, the lease that you've taken out on the building, all of the, the initial purchases of, of the inventory that you're going to be selling, all your dime. Okay. Why is that not looked at as then a loan 
to your company, which is legally separate from yourself anyway, even if you're a sole proprietor, proprietorship, there's legal separation between yourself and your company. Why is that not just viewed as a loan? And that once the profit starts rolling in and you make back all of the money you originally invested at that point, all that profit gets uh, from that point on gets freed up to be distributed amongst your workers. Why doesn't it happen that way? It's because of all this, these really flimsy arguments that, well, I took the risk. Well, I took the risk. I deserve the reward or I have more responsibility or I work harder. All these ways that, that rich people try to say, I'm just fundamentally a better person. And that's what all of these arguments come down to. Uh, the, the business owner's argument is always fundamentally, I'm a better person. Uh, whether I'm smarter than you because I came up with this idea or I took the risk so I'm a better person because I've, I've gone above and beyond or if this thing folds then it's, it's all on my shoulders. It all comes down to I'm a better person so I deserve more. So that's an inherent value judgment about everyone who is not in as fortunate a position as you. Same sort of, you know, baseless reasoning that that goes into this one race deserves to have all the riches of the world well everyone else doesn't you know it's it's the entire basis of of colonialism is that we're inherently better we we were technologically more advanced you know so we deserve whatever we get these are all very close in reasoning it's it's the idea that there are inherent hierarchies in both cases it's they're just inherent hierarchies some people are inherently better than others and deserve more uh, versus people are more or less the same, which is what I would argue is the minimum to be on the left, is the idea that the, the notion that everyone is more or less the same and therefore we deserve more or less the same opportunities in our lives and the same ability to affect our lives as every other person. But yeah, so, so back to what he was saying. He's talking about how these things always happen after the fact. It's, it's never, you start with the assumption that I'm just better than everyone else and uh, therefore I deserve to start a business. It's, it's more, my daddy loaned me a bunch of money and now I'm starting to get criticized for not paying my employees better. So I have to think of a reason for why I'm not paying them as well as myself. Well, it must be because I'm better, right? Uh, same sort of thing with race. Um, my country had these technologies and resources to come in and shape the land and build the factories and towns uh, according to our own will. Um, but I'm feeling kind of bad about how that has literally devastated hundreds or thousands of people from doing that. So it's because we're inherently better, right? You have, it's, it's always that way around it's never we assume we're better so we're going to do this stuff it's we are in a position to do this stuff and now we have to justify why we get to if that makes sense thanks for the follow fish missile <laughs> i like that i like that name that's funny uh good point sam the value is created by the workers it doesn't belong to the owner that should that should be the short and long of it really at the very least, compensation should be based on amount of work done. And if you look at it that way, no owner can just then sit, kick up their heels and let the profits roll in. Uh, landlording couldn't be a thing unless you were at the very least also the property manager and doing work to maintain those properties. Because um, if you look at it any other way, then yeah. The, the value that, that your company has created is through the labor that's done to create the value. So you have to do labor in order to create value. Even if you're an owner, you're not adding any value unless you're also a worker. So, you you know, your company might decide that, that you know, say, say we're going to look at things in a, in a worker-owned cooperative sort of a situation. Um, you may all democratically decide that certain positions are, yes, that the, the work is harder, the, the, the uh, responsibility is more, and therefore it deserves to be compensated at a higher level than everyone else. But at the very least, 
because everyone is putting in work, everyone should get a say in how the product of that labor is distributed. Um, also important to point out that even in worker cooperatives, there's still management hierarchies. It's just more efficient for some people to delegate decisions and some people to, you know, do the work that, that, that is delegated to them. So that doesn't go out the window. It's more just where does the profit go and how is the business run in general that then is taken over as a, a collective endeavor rather than the, the decisions and, and whims of uh, one person or a handful of people at the very top. Indeed. All right, let's continue on. Almost done with this uh, particular episode. Right. And it wasn't like, you know, they just decided to do that once they encountered these people and didn't understand them. And slavery, too. I mean, people went to Africa to to steal them some people. They didn't they didn't go, you know, as tourists and then look around and say, oh, look, look, there's these people who. Right. They, right. <laughs> we think are inferior. And therefore, and, I guess we'll. And, 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 and guess what are we going to do with them? Yeah, they didn't they didn't they didn't say like, oh, man, here's these people. You know, they're like subhuman and like three fifths of a human being. So what can we do? Oh, let's create slavery. No, it, it, I mean, but that's kind of like what I grew up on and what mm -hmm. people think. Mm -hmm. They just didn't know. And it's like, no, actually, no. What they knew was that there was an economy. They had like rice and cotton and other things that had sugar that had to be, you know, um, produced to make this economy uh, go. And they wanted cheap labor and they enslaved people. And then and then they later sort of deployed the, the science and all these other cultural forms to match and support the idea that they could exploit these people because they were inferior. So it's it really to me, even though, you know, once you really look at that, the idea that exploitation comes first is, is just, you know, it's just the more <laughs> rational explanation. Right. Right. And even some of this history that we heard about, you know, all kinds of people enslaved all kinds of people, including in in many cases, people enslaved people who looked like them. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, you know, it was only more in the kind of in the last few hundred years that at the same time that you had the Enlightenment and people to some degree having higher standards for how human beings treated each other, that then, then it, it seems that it became more necessary to have a justification to dehumanize folks before you to justify enslaving them. That's right. And, you know, um, but but it, but it's yeah, that's the slavery that came first, not the other way around. And I think it's easier for people to cool, think same. about it like it was it's all just a matter of attitudes and not understanding and like maybe people just didn't sit down and eat enough dinners together or something like that. Because when you think of it that way, you can make it about individuals who didn't understand, where when you understand the way that exploitation was sort of baked into the project of uh, Western uh, ex imperialism and, you know, the development of uh, the oh, United gosh. States, then you have to go and question much more fundamental structures and much more fundamental ideas about about our culture and all these other things. So I think it's, it's, it's harder to have to look at that. Yeah, I have to be the discord, sorry. Chenjirai Kumanika. Thanks to Nell Irvin Painter and Ibram Kendi and the folks from the Racial Equity Institute. We'll be hearing more from all of them in the next episode, in which we come to these shores, a look at how race thinking and whiteness blossomed well, that's one way of putting it, in colonial America and the USA. Is this a little bit crazy? It gets crazier, and we need to understand that, because folks, on crazy, we built a nation. <laughs> we did. If you like the idea of more people hearing this series and the show in general, please think about taking just a couple of minutes to give us a rating and review on iTunes or your podcast app of choice. If we All right, that's about it for this episode. Man, th this is such a great series. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to link it one more time. We'll go back to uh, the series overall. Seen on radio. Let's see if we can get... Let's see... So here, I think, is all, I think all of season two was the Seeing White series. So 
So I'll link that again. You know, check out the rest. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for that, Sam. Um, so here's Seeing White. Here's the whole podcast series. Oops. If you want to go check that out. Um, what'd you guys think? Did you, did you like this episode? Do you want to, do you want me to cover more in the future? Was this uh, a worthwhile look? Did you, did you learn anything, um, that you didn't think you would pick up? Um, what surprised you? Curious to know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll do more in this series later on if it's, uh, if it's something you guys want. But it covers a lot of different topics of whiteness. Let's see. So the next one, let's go all the way down here. Well, I should mention also also the guy that uh, he was was his uh, co-host there at the end, or that he brought on at the end, Jindrai Kiwanika, I think is his last name. He went on to do a really cool series called Uncivil. Um, let me actually find that because it's just that good. Let's look up on Pod News, but it was about it was about the the Civil War, um, and kind of the twisted history that's come out about the Civil War that still gets taught in some places to this day. But it's a uh, oops, it's a really good series. I'm gonna try and find it on on Pod News here. Here it is. Come on, here we go. So yeah, Uncivil is a really good one too. And he goes through the entire legacy of the Civil War and, and just how the different parts of it that that are not looked at. Um, I think there's an entire episode on on John Brown and his role in in uh, spurring the abolitionist movement. It's a really good one though. So there's that series Uncivil, pasting it right now. So there's that one. Another great one. So you liked it. All right. Looking like seeing a few people who liked it. And we should uh, we should look at it again at a different time. Maybe I'll make it a different series. Maybe I'll do the first episode next just to, to get a full rounded view of things. Um, I think the first one's probably the least valuable of it just because it's kind of setting up what the podcast is going to be but i don't think it's all that long either for that matter so yeah just called turning the lens uh how long even is that episode 60 yeah it's only 60 minutes long so i think it's the shortest episode too so maybe we'll cover that next time i don't think i got well you know what Maybe I do got enough time. What do you guys think? Do you wanna do you wanna listen to the opening to that series? Or do you wanna do something else? I guess otherwise I was thinking to either end it now or maybe play some Witcher. Witcher three. Because I think I figured out how to do it and I want to test it out to see if I can get it to uh display at a frame rate greater than one frame per second. <laughs> but yeah, I've been I've been trying to launch this this separate series of, of gaming i'm calling it the the sj witcher uh or the social justice witcher where i i leave all the decisions up to uh the audience and we're going to try and create we're going to see how close we can get in in a medieval feudal sort of landscape to uh the equivalent of a, a modern social justice warrior <laughs> are you down to okay down, down down for which part for the for the uh for the Witcher part or for doing that, that first episode, going through that quick. Maybe, how do we do a poll? I wonder if I, I can't think I can put a poll in chat. Actually, let's try it. We'll do a poll in the raid chat. If I can figure out how to do it. Oh, prediction. No, I don't want that though. I don't know how to do a poll. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> 
First episode. Okay, let's do that then. We'll quickly look at this. It's, it's not very long, but this will be this will make things more complete if we do the whole series. So here's uh, Turning the Lens, Seeing White, Part 1. Whether you're struggling with grief, relationships, oh, or stress, the um, slash, uh, it snags my interest, and I call oh. Hugh Glee and something he's... The headline is about the to the video got enough delegates to clinch the ramping oh, dot com slash scene. There we go. I'm minding my own business one day, looking in on my Facebook feed. It's the summer of 2016, in the frenzy of the oh. campaign season, a few weeks after Donald J. Trump got enough delegates Episode. to clinch the okay. Republican nomination. Someone's posted a video clip from the daytime talk show The View. So yeah, it looks like most people are, are down for the, the this episode here. But we can do The Witcher another time. Tomorrow night, actually, I'm going to be doing something uh, that I've been doing more of lately. We're going to be uh, sitting in on a permaculture design class from uh, my good friend Mike Hogue. And uh, it should be a really good one. So assuming I can get off work in time, and I can come and cover that. Look forward to that. We'll be continuing on with, with Mike Hogue's permaculture design course uh, series. And just sitting in on that and, you know having a good time uh but yeah some sometime this week i'll probably play the witcher just you know kind of whenever strikes my fancy i think it, i think it'd be good to continue on with this episode here the headline is about the comedian and actor dl hughley and something he said on the show it snags my interest and i click Already. I mean, we often talk about, you know, the, what's going on with Donald Trump. Did you right. ever think he, he would even get this far? No, but I think I'm not shocked that he is. You're not? Why? No, I mean, because I think that ultimately America's aspirational. Like, to me, uh, Obama is what we would like to be. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Donald Trump and his supporters are what we are. Hey. They are what you we great. are. Wait, wait. Listen, we, we want to be different. Like, you, we'll put Harriet Tubman on the front of a $20 bill, uh -huh. but leave Andrew Jackson on the back. So we have a slave on the front and a slave on <laughs> the back. So even when black people are on money, we still got a supervisor. So, uh... <laughs> the last bit is funny, but it was the part before that that stopped me in my tracks. This bit. Obama is what we would like to be. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Donald Trump and his supporters are what we are. Hey. I have to admit, yep. my reaction at the time was, hold on a second. First of all, Obama won the whole shebang. Twice. Trump's going to be the nominee for one party, but the whole country hasn't elected him to anything yet, and it won't happen. <laughs> you may remember that's what most people thought at the Little time. Little did you know. Besides that, I bristled at Hughley's we. I know it's we the people and all that, but when you put it in a sentence like this, Donald Trump and his supporters are what we are. Wasn't sure I wanted to be implicated in that we. Sure. Of course, we Trump did win. Say what you like about the perfect all those, all series of gusts are. that blew him across the finish line. Hillary's emails, Vladimir Putin, James Comey, Jill Stein's voters, the Electoral College. Yeah. Trump won. Yeah. I'd... And as for that we, it seems fair to say that DL... <laughs> That's a good point, Natalie. We, Obama? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I mean, you got to consider that, that DL Hughley is coming from a more just regular old uh, democratic liberal point of view. So yeah, leftists uh, probably not seeing him as so aspirational considering the amount of, of you know, s warrantless surveilling of civilians that he did, uh, the amount of drone strikes he took out uh, around the world and any number of things not not pushing hard enough for medicare for all on and on yeah he's he's definitely not <laughs> aspirational <laughs> if you if you really take a more objective look at it but but i i got what he was saying he's he's definitely looking at it like oh yeah yeah bomb was the best he's it, he shows that anyone can can be the president and you know i don't know i i just read more of a liberal perspective from dl hugely hugely there Hughley, who's black, was talking about a nation for all its growing diversity, a nation still dominated by people who look not like him, but like me. 70% mm -hmm. of voters were white in 2016, oh. and 58% of white voters chose Trump. That right there is an important statistic. 78% of voters were white. 
That's that's curious because that's not the percentage of people that are white. Now, there's probably a, a number of things at, at play there, but I think a big one that 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 the analysts never really talk about is that by and large, the people that occupy the the lowest tier of jobs in this country, the people that have to have multiple jobs to get by, are non-white people. So to even have time to participate in the democratic process, to have time to really make an informed decision about candidates, uh, even know a thing about any candidate and where they stand on issues that that uh, support them um, or, or affect them, uh, to be able to then also have time to go vote, especially if you're trying to juggle several different jobs in order to make ends meet, uh, those are things that are going to be beyond the realm of, of, of plausibility. Uh, it's going to be unrealistic to expect people in the lowest rungs of the economic ladder to, to have that time and ability to participate in that way. And as I, I keep mentioning, I believe that is partially by design, uh, especially when you look at the, the massive voter disenfranchisement efforts that, that continue to go on in this country. And, and part of that's just a product of living under a, a, a bourgeois democracy, a democracy that is, is set up primarily for the rich people to participate in and protect their capital interests. Uh, everything from being able to hire lobbyists to, to uh, push various bodies of, of government to adopt their policies, uh, to um, getting kickbacks for donating campaigns, on and on and on. It's, it's pretty clear that we live under a bourgeois democratic system at best. So it's, it's, it's a system for the rich, by the rich, largely. In, in order to be a candidate, even at a local level, you need to have enough income that you can take time off your job, likely, to go and, and, and campaign. You have to be able to pay people to work for you, or you at least have to have the ability to raise a lot of money, which also probably means you have a lot of connections and are in a position of relative comfort. So it's no wonder that most of the people that end up running for any sort of office tend to be business owners uh, or, or at least benefit greatly from business ownership. Um, so yeah, just a little food for thought there of why that statistic of 78% of people being white or 78% of voters being white, why that is indicative of the sort of bourgeois system that we live under. Yep, more money, right? That's right, Natalie. Yeah, it, I mean, it seems, I, I, I can see that point of view, John, that we are headed towards a, an authoritarian system. Um, and, and certainly if we keep going the way that, the, that it seems most Republicans are on board with right now, it's going to be reality sooner rather than later. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it seems as though we're getting to a point where uh, neoliberal policies of gutting social safety nets, of giving all sorts of breaks to the job creators and so forth, that that whole system is running out of steam. It's, it's starting to collapse under its own weight. It's cannibalizing the people that literally support it, that being the workers. Something's got to give. So my estimation is either there's going to be someone that that's, gets into power who's going to be an FDR sort of figure and creates another new deal and solidifies uh, liberal capitalist interests for the next 50 years or we're going to break the other way. And it's going to be an extreme authoritarian who's going to come into power and we're going to face the dissolution of, of the nation, really. Uh, whether it's outright civil war, whether it's it's putting us into wars with other countries, wh whatever it may be, another right turn, and I think we're probably done as a nation. Uh, and that's not to say that that a soft left turn is going to be great for everybody, because what it will likely mean is is again the strengthening of unions once more. It's going to be the same things that happened in the first New Deal. It's instead of adopting socialism 
we're going to try and fix the worst elements of, of capitalism by back to work programs, by strengthening unions, by making it possible again for someone right out of high school to be able to get a job that supports an entire family, not just themselves. And right now we're at the point where a minimum wage job full time can't really even get you an apartment and, and have you let you have any money left over to live on in any major city in the, in the country. So the idea that at some point back in, in pre eighties time, uh, you could support your entire family, like your, your, your spouse and your, you know, 2.3 kids on a single factory job. We are so far degraded from that point that it's hard to even imagine anymore. So that's my prediction. It's going to go one of two ways. It's going to be a Bernie Sanders type who sweeps in and, and makes sweeping good historical change that, that, that props the system up for another 50 years, or it's going to be someone who comes in and totally breaks everything apart and descends us into chaos. It's, it's probably going to go one of those two ways. It seems like something's got to give at this point, though, because wealth disparity is so bad right now, and... The, the the greed of the people at the top is so much like that it's not even reality anymore it's all just a status thing it's uh you know who can have the most billions to their name at this point who can exploit their workers the hardest and get away with it um who can gigify something you know reinvent be a disruptor by reinventing the taxi company or the way groceries are delivered or you know any number of these gig economy things that you know don't actually change anything just mean the same thing with less regulation <laughs> uh those things are not going to bring us out of anywhere uh and it seems as though neither party really has any big solutions at this point so yeah anyway that's uh, I guess that's a little bit of an aside. Let's let's get back to uh, the video. Let's get yeah, because I definitely I only got twenty minutes left. Let's uh, let's try and finish this up here. Thus, the Van Jones election night comment that went viral. This was Evolved a white lash for sure. This was a white lash against a changing country. It was a white lash against a black president nope. in part. Nope. And that's the part where the pain comes. People can debate how big a factor straight-up racism was in Trump's victory, but his year-long drumbeat of remarks and tweets and retweets, giving voice to white resentment toward people of color and religious minorities, offending millions and pulling scabs off old American wounds, all of that was not too much for the 62,984,825 people who colored in the bubble next to Trump's name. See, I think that's definitely a factor. I think more than anything, what people wanted in that election was real change. Because, uh, you know, there was definitely rumblings at that time that, that Trump was an outright racist. I mean, he definitely dog whistled plenty of anti-immigration stuff. But I think more than anything, the people that voted for him saw that he was going to He was going to make a, a change, you know, the ones that really believed in him. He, it, was, it was going to be something different. They actually bought into the outsider position, even though he was completely an insider on all of that stuff. Uh, one of the the elites that he was supposedly railing against. Um, yeah. So racism, sure, sure. In that the, 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 the uh, people that own businesses, small business owners, and uh, people that were in power, for sure, saw that he was going to do the most to preserve their power and their position. And if that meant keeping down uh, immigrants and, and black people, then so be it. So sure, racism did play a huge part. But I think th I, I think there's also something to be said that a lot of the people that, that voted for Trump the first time said they also would have voted for Sanders. Because those were the two... Those are the two candidates that, that spoke the most about change in the country, big change. You know, Trump preached a, a message of, of returning to an older times, which definitely 
tons of racist undercurrents just in the idea of, of, of make America great again. Uh, so he was pretty, he was preaching returning to stability and or an order, which is an old order of white people being on top. So yeah, obviously racial component, uh, but also an economic component. Uh, we will make things safe for you again. Uh, we know you're afraid of all these changes um, and that you feel insecure in your economic position. We're going to do things for you. Uh, Trump did very well in, in like coal country and stuff like that, places that are really desperate economically. So I don't think it was entire. It can't be entirely explained by racial issues. Um, but again, what, what I was saying was uh, a lot of those supporters of Trump the first time around said they would have voted for Sanders had he gotten the nomination. So I think to those people, assuming we take them at their word, what they really wanted was something just different. Like they, they saw the, the current system is not working for them at all. Um, they may see jobs leaving their, their rural area or their formerly industrialized area and just feel really insecure about the future. And here comes in someone saying everything is going to be okay. Or here comes another person saying, I'm going to fight for you. I see you. I, I'm, I'm not just one of these coastal elites. Um, I'm really going to fight for things that will meaningfully change your life. So the idea that there was actually overlap somewhere between would-be Bernie, Bernie voters and would-be Trump voters to me says that that change was more the driving factor in that election than anything else. I could be wrong about that, though. Thanks for the follow, Camito 3 We are learning about uh, the history of racism, really, in America. Yeah, but here's the thing, Natalie, is that 50% of the country was never for Trump because 50% of the country doesn't even vote. So we can't really ascribe a, a stance to the people that just don't vote for whatever reason. And as I, as I keep mentioning here, a big reason that a lot of people don't vote is they don't have the time or ability to inform themselves and participate in, in the voting process. They're too worried about just baseline survival, getting to their next job, juggling jobs, that sort of thing. Um, so to say that 50% of the country was against him, I think it's more, it's closer to like 30%. Um, and about 30% was for, uh, for uh, Hillary. And of course, numerically, more people voted for Hillary than did for Trump. But because we have a conservative back ass words, you know, bourgeois capitalist democracy, the Senate, or the Electoral College, the Senate as well, but the Electoral College in this case is is a huge boon for uh, just conservatism in general. It, it's going to throttle the will of the people. I mean, the whole conception of the Electoral College is we can't trust the people to, to make the right decision. Um, and the one time, the one time that a person arose and looked like they were going to be the, the absolutely the sort of person that uh, the electoral system was supposed to keep out and stop the people from voting for was the time that it, it didn't actually do its job. But that's beside the point. The point is, yeah, 30%, maybe a third of the country at most is for any particular candidate that wins. Uh, but I always... You know, we're, we're lucky to break 50% participation in, in eligible voters. And that's just eligible voters. That doesn't even include the, the millions more who have been legally disenfranchised through uh, being a prisoner or having their votes, voting rights stripped of them for one reason or another. So that doesn't even include them either. Um, so people that say that we don't live in a democracy, they got half a point, you know. Representative... Republic is still a democracy, even if it skews towards uh, the, 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 the capital class, still some semblance of a democracy. There still is participation that is, in theory, open to everyone uh, so that everyone can be represented. But when it comes down to the rubber meeting the road, yeah, it's, we, we don't live in a, a, a truer sense of the word democracy. The will of the people is rarely represented. Which is a boon for conservatism. I mean, let's be honest. 
but yeah, let's, let's continue on. I want to finish this up pretty quick here. The rise of Trump is just one of the many things in the last few years that have turned a newly challenging, yeah, direct just what is Nowhere up near to direct all, spotlight sure. on white people and whiteness. Do I need to list them? From the many police shootings of unarmed black people to the massacre of nine black churchgoers by the white supremacist terrorist Dylan Roof, to cultural stuff like Oscars so white. Again, another well, lone I'm here wolf at the he's Academy white. Awards, uh, otherwise known as the uh, White People's Choice Awards. <laughs> and what feels like a relentless drip, drip, month by month of glimpses into the everyday of American life. Moments not meant for public consumption, but captured on smartphones and sent ricocheting around the internet. The manhandling of black teenage girls by white cops and school cops. Those college kids in Oklahoma. Fraternity brothers seen on video engaging in a racist chant. Oh, God. Let's, okay. Okay. Yeah. Or this one in the town where I live, Durham, that. North Carolina. I didn't know he was going to do that. After a near accident on a busy road, a man with brown skin stops his car to apologize and records the fury of a middle-aged white woman in a nice late model sedan. Ma I'm gonna... Calm down, ma'am. Ma'am, ma'am, please relax. It's not Relax? Relax. I'm sorry. I did not see you. Just relax. Well, you better open up your goddamn eyes and learn how to drive, you fuck. Okay, I'm guessing that's going to be an epithet, so I'm just going to pause it right there. Uh, shoot. Let me just... I'm gonna, okay, I'm going to mute it. I'm going to play ahead for a second. Oh, another one of these. One second here. Yeah. got to ban that person, too. So, yeah, you, you get the idea. Well, let's just skip forward a touch. Um, how can I skip it without... Jeez. <laughs> Let's see the transcript. Let's see what she's about to say. Do, 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 do. Oh, yeah. She's about to say something really horrible. Hmm. 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 Maybe we're just going to leave it there. Because otherwise I'm going to have to find a different podcast player that I can skip forward on. It's not letting me do that just from here. So, I think maybe we'll just leave it at that. Or let, let's see if I can find a different player quickly. We will go to Spotify. Scene on radio. Okay, where is it? Let me try and find it one second. There it is. Scene on radio. Oh, I'm gonna have to go way back. That's three. Where's season? Oh, here we go. Back to season one. I'm going to have to look ahead in this transcript altogether. Just getting, a, getting forward to it. Alright, let's see where we're at on this one. I'm just going to play it on Spotify instead, so I'll stop sharing that screen. That way I'll have better controls, and we can skip past the worst things that humans say. Uh, there we go. See it on radio. We're going to share that. All right. So let's see. I'm going to change our respective views. Although, let's do that. We'll do it like that so you can see it a little better. So I think we're at about this point here. Still dominated by people who look not like him, but like me. 70% of voters were uh, white. Changing feet of remarks and 984,825 people 
who colored in the bubble next to Trump's name. The unarmed black people to the Place awards. Link of black teenage girls by white cops and school cop. The town where I live, Durham, oh, North Carolina. Relax. Relax. Okay. Yes. Yep. Yep. Microphones. Okay. At people there we of go. Color. We're we're past it now. That goes for me Jeez. too. Over several decades as a reporter and documentary maker, I've told the stories of black folk from Chicago to the Mississippi Delta, Latinos from North Carolina to the apple orchards of Washington State, Native Americans from the Navajo Nation in the Southwest to Ojibwe country up north. I'm proud of a lot of that work, but if I think about how I built those stories, I've often treated whiteness like the proverbial elephant in the room. You might hear about some white individuals or white-run institutions, the, the alleged bad apples, the discriminators. But like that's the last of the racial epithets, so we'll be beyond that point now. Thank goodness. They should put a warning on these these episodes. I swear. Like most American reporters, I've usually left white people as a group, the white race, Oops. unnamed. In the coming batch of episodes, a series we call "Seeing White." turning the lens around, looking straight at white America and at the notion of whiteness itself. Where did this idea of a white race come from? God? Nature? Or is it man-made? And if somebody manufactured the, the last idea, one. why? For what purpose? How has the meaning of white changed over the centuries and how does it function now? The stories that we carry around about whiteness and what it means Stories we may not even know we're carrying, but we are, all of us. Are those stories true? For the record, I am white. <laughs> I'm about the whitest boy you're ever going to meet. Stephen Colbert talking to his show's band leader, John Batiste. John, have you met anybody whiter than me? Yeah, I, I, I think I know somebody. Yeah? Who? Yeah. Who? It's a guy I grew up with. What's his name? Can I say his name? What's his name? Oh, his name's Andy. Oh, I know Andy. You know Andy? Yeah, the white guy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we meet, we, we meet at the white meeting. Yeah, I know Andy. So I just want to say I'm at least as white as Colbert. Even my hair, which used to be the color of his, was in a hurry to turn white. So that means I'm well positioned for this project. I've got the credentials, the inside scoop on the whole white thing. Right? Hey, Chenjirai Kumanika? Yeah, who's this? John B. Wynn. Hey, John, what's going on, man? How you doing? How you doing? I'm, I'm all right. You? I'm good, man. You know, one day at a time. So, I'm doing this uh, this crazy project looking at whiteness. Mm. And uh, uh -oh. I'm just not sure I'm up. I'm, I'm not sure I'm the right person for the job. I'm a little concerned about my perspective as a white dude. And thinking I might... I maybe could use some backup, somebody to kind of check me a little bit and bring in, you know, help flesh out the story with the perspective, uh, your perspective as a person of color in this world. What do you think? Right. You're not asking me. It's kind of, I mean, I got to admit, that's kind of funny the way he's framing it. He's making it sound like, well, I'm just a white guy. I got to have well any black person to give me perspective. It seems kind of a... Uh, Almost an id poll, if you want to use a a, a uh, online ism way to look at things. But but it's not just any black person that he's calling up. It's one who really studies racial issues, like as his job. So <laughs> it's a little bit more. Uh, there's a little bit more behind that decision than just hey, yo, might as well just call it my only black friend. <laughs> you speak for all people of color, are you? Yes. Of course. Okay, good, because, <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. So <laughs> That's what he does, yeah. Hey, my name is Chenjirai Kumanika. I'm a professor of critical cultural media studies, cultural industries, and things like that. Not only that. a black person, but Currently, I teach at Clemson University issues. in the Department of Communication. In the fall of 2017, I'll be starting in Rutgers School of Inf uh, Communication and Information. And, uh, yeah. So Chenjirai will make regular appearances in this series. People who study this stuff often say that white people ourselves are not very good. I'm very glad to hear that, uh, Kamido 3. 
You say you're from Argentina, spent a year in the U.S. and discovered Howard Zinn. Definitely, um, definitely considering covering a people's history of the U United States at some point on the stream. So glad you found the stream, too. I usually do theory streams. We, we're covering right now the ABC of Anarchism, also known as What is Communist Anarchism, every, every Wednesday, although that's been on uh, a little bit of a hiatus lately because I've been covering a, a friend of mine who's putting on a permaculture design class on Mondays and Wednesdays, so that's kind of taken precedent. But but in general, I usually do theory streams. And then we also, on, on Sundays, I just kind of do whatever. So so today we're looking at uh, the, the history of how whiteness was created and wielded, uh, which is probably the best way of putting it, against people who were not. And this is the, this is the opening episode. We, we started with, with episode two because it's the most important, in my opinion, of the series. But, uh, but yeah, we're just we're backtracking a little bit to do episode one. But at seeing whiteness, on the contrary, we tend to have blind spots, large and small, about the way it all works. Oh, and actually, Chenjer, I won't have to speak for all people of color, because as you'll see, quite a few POCs will show up in the episodes. He can just speak for his smart and thoughtful self. And the stuff for this studies. introduction, Chenjerai and I put some thoughts and worries on the table about the series itself. I like the focus on whiteness because I feel like, in general, when we're talking about race and ethnicity, the focus tends to be on, you know, people of color and, uh, you know, whiteness just kind of is invisible. And so I like that. But you know, there's like a couple of things I'm concerned about. Like when you say it right off the gate, there's a couple of things that just come up like, oh, I hope we don't go in this direction. Right. Tell me. Well, this is the I'll tell you, the big thing is this. There's a tendency in this country to frame the discussion about race and ethnicity and oppression in terms of something called race relations. Right. <laughs> you know, and this interpersonal this overwhelmingly focuses on things. the individual attitudes right you know, of people almost like race racism is like this disease and the and the overwhelming Often puzzle is framed is like who has it. Right. Yeah, right. Exactly. That's that's how we think about it, isn't it? And how are people how are we getting along, sort of are we nice to each right. other or not? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How are we getting along? That's that's that seems to be like I mean, it's incredible to be how many like really intelligent people will still frame this issue like that. I've seen Obama do it, you know, and I think the thing that these conversations really need is something that people are deeply illiterate with is this issue of structural racism or institutionalized patterns of exploitation and oppression that are that are like racialized in certain ways, you know, and really just a more complex engagement with how power works and what race and ethnicity has to do with it. Mm -hmm. You know, this is to me almost distinct from this problem of, it's not distinct, I guess, but almost distinct from race relations or prejudice. And so I, I really have a problem with people framing like that. In fact, John, if I can, I want to deputize you as a white person to go out into the world and like sort of intervene when you see people f framing it like that. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? But yes, I hear you. Power. How does power work? How does how how do systems? Uh, and, and there's an idea that people have talked about that you can have, you can have racism without individual racists. Absolutely. Because systems and structures have been set up in a way that exactly. they sort of run this way on their own at this point, right? Or at least that's that's, that's, a, right. that's yeah. a thesis to be looked at. Right. I mean, I, I mean, I think and in a way that's like more worrisome in a way. Right. It's like not just when you have like the person who we all know is a bigot. But actually, when you can have a system where people are not they don't have those attitudes, but somehow they can be incentivized to participate. Absolutely, John. In a, in a system of oppression. That's that's what I'm more worried about. You know, yeah, I have a worry, too. Uh, and, a, and a disclaimer that I would want to make about about this project, and that is, I'm concerned that people will look at the title of the series, "Seeing White," and they'll think, "Oh, this is this is a series about uh, white supremacists and neo Nazis and the KKK again." Oh yeah, oh for, yeah. 
and I want people to know that that's not it covers, that's it not covers what we're up to here. I believe they do get into uh, those issues. Please, please, do, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, those folks, right? those folks have had the, have, have, are having their moment. It's but, about more. Uh, it's, it's about more the, the systems that reinforce um, right. White I mean, who knows? There might be you know there be some overt racism that gets referred to and so on, but mostly, what we want to talk about is uh, you know the rest of us um, who are not overtly stated white supremacists and and sort of how how things go down among the rest of us yeah i'm 100 percent in support of that i mean i just think like you know it's hard because there is it is appalling when you see some of these crazy examples of bigotry and now people coming into explicit white supremacy and you know white nationalism and things like that but but the thing I'm much more interested in is the kind of whiteness that's just institutionalized. It's mm, there, true, you know, yeah. it just structures everyday. Well, here I go. Everyday interactions, but also uh, every, you know, just patterns and how institutions are set up and all these other kinds of things. Right. Who has what rights, how resources are distributed. Those things are just in, just sort of ingrained. They're just with us there invisibly like the water that we're in. And that's what I'm more interested in. That's our challenge, to go on this journey together and see if we can get a little better at seeing the water. Next time, we'll get into it by going back in time, quite a ways back, back to the days when, though there were people who looked like me, there's no sign they thought of themselves as white. There was no notion of race. For sure. <laughs> people could look at other people and see some people were lighter and some people were darker. But what did that mean? What did that mean? All right, we're going to pause it there since we literally just listened to that episode and we've, we've gotten all that information. So there you have it. That was, that was just the opening episode. So, you know, a little bit more context to, to where this series goes and, and what it focuses on. And as they say, they're, they're trying to get away from individual groups or even or individual people, or even groups that, that are overtly racist and get more into the, the structures of racism that, that permeates all of American society. And, and they're focused on mainly America, but this could be broadly applicable to uh, any place where, where white people dominate. So, so yeah, hope you all are, are still enjoying it. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll do more of this uh, next weekend then, if, if you guys are liking it enough. Um, yeah, um, and always as always, the the Discord is the place to talk about suggestions for the stream. What what you like to see? Uh, it is a human condition for sure. It is it is basically you know everyone has prejudice. It's it's kind of a human. It's kind of human nature that like if you you only experience one kind of thing, one kind of people, one kind of way of doing things, and then all of a sudden you experience something novel or a person that's completely different that person then becomes the stand-in for all of the people that that are, are from that same culture or ethnicity or whatever because instead of having zero knowledge now you have a little bit of knowledge and it's true what they say that that a little bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing because your 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 brain wants to categorize things so now you have your people and what they believe and what they do and this entirely other group of people that are all that are completely all represented by this one person that you now know so from that alone prejudices can start to form um uh, you know just one thing that comes to mind is there is an episode of uh star trek next generation where riker i believe it was riker uh, goes to to serve as as some kind of uh, exchange with the the Klingons, and his only knowledge of the Klingons has been through Worf, right? He sees them as very stoic and and you know warlike and all this stuff, uh, without humor and all these 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 sorts of traits, and so he's very surprised when he goes and they're they're all cracking jokes and they're more, uh, you know, they're not all like Worf. Because his entire conception of Klingons was all funneled through his one experience. So that's the way that prejudices can start. And from there, they can, you know, 
keep on going and, and building upon themselves until you have a whole group of people that have wildly inappropriate views of an entirely other group of people. That's just one way it can start. So, it, so in a way, it is a natural thing for people to develop prejudices just because of the way our brains work and the way we try to categorize and, and see patterns and things that we are seeing about the world around us. On another level, though, especially in an age where there is so much ability to see other things outside of ourselves, see other experiences, experience little tastes of other lives that we don't ever see firsthand, um, we have a lot of tools that we can use to overcome prejudices if we only look to see them. And we have tools to analyze our own systems and see how they might be prejudicial, even if they're not meant to be. Even if they're not meant to be. Uh, yeah, we, we, we do tend to demonize things that are unpredictable. That's a good way of putting it too, John. Uh, it's just kind of a, the human fear of the unknown. Like, oh, we don't really know about this thing, so I'm going to put it in a danger category. And if it's dangerous, we're going to ascribe reasons why it's dangerous, whether or not those have any bearing on reality. It's just, again, the human brain's natural tendency to dislike things not being categorized, wanting to place them into category, categories, and also seeking to protect ourselves against potential threats that we don't see coming. So it's just kind of the default setting to be afraid of things that are different, um, if they're different in a way that, that seems uh so outside of your own comfort zone that that it makes you feel unsafe right but we can overcome all these things that's the point really and that's really the point of this series too is to to see the the architecture that has been put in place to intentionally or, or unintentionally hold a bunch of people back for the advantage of one smaller or, or one uh, favored group that being white people. But anyway, I think that, that'll do it for tonight. I'm over my time. I usually like to end at nine. So we're going to go ahead and raid into somebody. If you have any suggestions, now's the time to put it out there. Again, I hope you join me again tomorrow night. We'll be doing uh, another permaculture design class from Mike Hogue. Um, should be a really good time. So I think it's going to start right around five o'clock central standard time. So assuming I'm off work in time and I can get home and get that running, we'll, we'll start right then. Um, and he's got, he's just bursting with valuable information. I think you'll really like it. The last one that we covered was, was a big hit, generated a lot of discussion. So got big hopes for this one too. Let's see who's on right now, who we can go ahead and raid into. I tend to like to uh, support smaller channels. Oh, you know what? I was talking about Shark 30 Zero the other, uh, earlier. So let's see. Let's just see if he's going to be on for a little bit here. Just a meme stream. Yeah. Casual stuff. So let's do Shark 30 Zero, in fact. I haven't seen if you all have made any suggestions, but I think we'll do that. You're going to bread? Okay, we'll have fun with that, Sam. I think I'm going to do Shark 30 Zero. Because I mentioned him as as one of the one of the good debate bros, or at least one of the ones that's that's really good faith, and I, I feel has a lot of integrity, um, and really is more what the model of, of debate bro should be. So if you're joining me from someplace other than Twitch, there's a good Twitch streamer you can go check out. If you're seeing this video later on, go go check him out. Um, otherwise, we're going to start the raid momentarily. Thank you all for joining me. I really hope to see you tomorrow night once again. Uh, and then also Wednesday, where I think we'll probably be doing more permaculture stuff. So lots of big stuff ahead. Oh, so they haven't even started yet. They're about to start. So just hang in there with them. Thank you all for joining me. And thanks again, Touring News, for the raid. That was very generous of you. I, I always appreciate that. I'll get you back sometime soon. <laughs>